Village Council Public Workshop Agenda. The date is February 22nd, 2023. The time is 734. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by a posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, by mail to the Ridgewood News, the record, and by submission to all persons entitled to same as provided by law of a schedule, including the date and time of this meeting. Roll call. Deputy Mayor Perrin. Here. Councilmember Reynolds. Here. Councilmember Reutz. Here. Councilmember Winograd. Here. Mayor Vagianos. Here. Will you please join me in the flag salute? This week, we lost a member of our community, Susan Boucher, who is the mother of police officer Doug Boucher. Would you all please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you very much. We will now go to public comments. I ask, uh, and remember, we will take as many as 10 people from the audience if there are people who want to comment on uh, our hybrid, hybrid access. You each have three minutes. I ask that all your comments be respectful. Thank you. Name and address, please. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, I'm Jim Bossler. I live at 821 Newcomb Road. Over Jim, could you speak more directly into the microphone? Over in the lawns. How's that? Good. Can you repeat your name and address, please? What? Can you repeat your name and address, please? Okay, I'm Jim Bossler. I'm 821 Newcomb Road in Ridgewood, obviously, over in the lawns. All right. I'm here to speak on Pleasant Park, and I'm here to oppose a 90-foot baseball field that was po potentially being proposed to be put in there. At the meeting, council meeting on February 1st, uh, one of the council people asked to bring an overlay to this meeting to show to see if that park would fit into Pleasant Park. Um, at the time that you want to do it, it was, when you look at the overlay, and I've seen overlays before, you're going to be seeing that the overlay, everybody's going to say it fits into that park, potentially. However, I suggest when you look at the overlay, you look around the park, because that's what's going to be affected the most. And I say that from, it's an active and passive park. <clears throat> the passive park includes, a, is a forest, basically, and it includes your oak, your beech tree, your tulipia tree. All these trees are 70 to 100 feet tall, and probably some of them are over 100 years old. Secondly, and probably most importantly, you're going to introduce a 90-foot baseball field into, into a grade school. The grade school has approximately 400 kids in it already. You're also going to be introducing a grade school where there are only two roads that dead end at that school. That would be going through a community where the streets have houses on both sides. If you get off those streets, you're going into a community where there are over 1,000 kids under the age of 18. Now think about it. With a 90-foot baseball field, you're going to be introducing players of the ages of 16 to 18, potentially 20 years old, all new drivers. So do you want to introduce new drivers into a community of over 1,000 kids? I think not. Thirdly, from the overlay, well, I've already mentioned and talked to this, that athletic field there, which is actually Pleasant Park and not Lower Hawes, already is doing its yeoman's share of the work. It supports two to three junior baseball leagues. It has a multi-sports field for soccer, for girls and boys soccer, for girls and boys lacrosse. On Sundays, there are also soccer leagues of adult men who play on it. You also have the baseball field where on a Sunday morning you can see older men playing pickup games. 
So the park is fulfilling the needs of the community. It is fulfilling the needs of not only the community for, for the local, but also for Ridgewood in total. Finally, my only other point is, and it goes back to three things, economics, environmental, and community. The economics behind changing that field, I've seen plans that go up to one and a half million dollars, and I just think it's just not worth the money. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Dr. Philip Dolce. I live at 164, uh, 625 Kingsbridge Lane. I am a professional historian, and today my job is to speak truth to power. That is exactly what I have to do. Unlike most parks the village of, uh, in the village, Ridgewood is designed as a historic site by the state. Ridgewood has finally reunited the village across Route 17 by creating a historic district for this area. Shedler will play the leading role in this historic district. The plan which the village is now considering contains a larger playing field or fields which already has been defeated multiple times for excellent reasons. The issue of putting larger fields on Shedler property is not new, which the council has not acknowledged. The plan to developed by the Department of Public Works dated 1992 shows the elimination of the Shedler House, parking near Route 17, and multiple athletic fields. This plan was defeated. The Village of Ridgewood Department of Public Works uh, planned for a, mo a large multi-purpose field for Shedler Park dated 2012 was also defeated. For over 30 years, we've been fighting to keep Shedler property as historic. The village keeps coming up with the same ideas despite being defeated over and over again. The future of the Shedler property is, is already in place. It is historic. The State Historic Preservation Office has stated, quote, historic properties and the environment in which they exist are irreplaceable assets that contribute to the quality of life that residents enjoy and expect. And that's exactly what we want. We want to enjoy and expect this from this historic district. The reasons we are still discussing the same issues is that there is a great deal of money that has been raised by athletic groups. This, power, uh, this powers elections as well as other matters. However, it never deals with history, the facts, or the truth. We need to stand behind history, the facts, and the truth. In addition, if larger fields are added to Shedler, anyone in New Jersey can use them. Anyone in New Jersey. So you're opening the field to anyone in New Jersey because the state has financed it. So don't do this. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Good evening. I'm Matthew Rossi from 516 West Saddle River Road, as well as 28 Chestnut Street. I would like to speak a few words today about the revised plans for the Shedler property. The surrounding neighbors understand the flooding in Ridgewood. I myself have children on the cusp of entering Ridgewood Athletics, which I see as very important. However, increasing the field size seems to have negative effects that far outweigh the good. Even more problematic, prior studies on the same property are now being completely disregarded in the name of expediency. Here are some topics I urge the council to review by third party experts. Noise. Similar fields in adjacent towns in the same proximity to Route 17 have proved problematic due to Route 17 noise. Can anyone on the council even tell us what the average dust bowl reading is on the proposed field area? I've seen no studies presented or requested by the council on noise on Route 17 and how it may affect athletics. Parking. West Saddle River Road is a narrow street. Increasing the field side size will draw increased traffic. Does anyone know how many cars a high school game can draw and how those cars would fit in the neighborhood? Again, I've seen no studies showing how parking will affect the neighborhood and what safety concerns may arise. Other fields. With the numerous factors on this property, historic preservation, noise, traffic, state approval, lack of parking, etc., 
It seems there may be safer, cheaper, faster to develop areas for a full-size field. But again, I've seen no studies presented to or requested by the council to look at alternatives. I'm not an expert on village planning or flood mitigation or traffic or wildlife or historic preservation. But then again, the council isn't either. And all I can see is a plan that's fast and loose. Increasing the field size, disregarding the plan developed in 2016 without any third party professional studies on a myriad of topics, topics under the auspice of moving fast is not fair. I would like the council to consider how flawed this logic is. Moving towards a plan that will take so much longer to implement because of inherent complexities. I also want to let the council know as a resident of the surrounding community, we're unified on following through on the previously agreed upon plans. With those plans, we are content. Furthermore, this community is a resilient one, filled with parties that will not make this new plan easy to implement. Lawyers live here, voters live here, doctors live here, people not afraid to call the news live here, people not afraid to call SHPO live here. I urge the council to stick to the original plan that will get rid of another field quickly or at very least provide due diligence from third party experts on why a new plan is a sound one and not just because a town employee knows how to work in a field on AutoCAD. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, I'm Patty Infantino from Six Betty Court. It's not working, not working. I have a timer. Go ahead, Patty. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about artificial turf, and I'm going to talk about what the experts say. I'm reading from uh, uh, Dr. S uh, Sarah Evans' paper, and she is an assistant professor at the Children's Environmental Health Center at the Department of Environmental Health and Public Health at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, we, the Children's Environmental Health Center of the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai, strongly discourage the installation of artificial turf fields due to the uncertainties surrounding the safety of these products. As pediatricians, epidemiologists, laboratory scientists, people come to us to ask us uh, concerned parents and physicians regarding the wide scale use of artificial turf surfaces on school grounds and in park properties. This led us to conduct a review of the risks and benefits of artificial playing services, which, uh, during which we found significant gaps in evidence supporting the safety of artificial turf products. And this, this was the result. Children and young adults are uniquely vulnerable to harmful exposures from artificial turf surfaces. This is due to a number of factors, including their unique physiology and behaviors, rapidly developing organ systems, and immature detoxification mechanisms. Vulnerability persists through the teen years as the reproductive and nervous systems continue to develop beyond the first two decades of life. Children and young athletes breathe faster than adults at rest, putting them at greater risk for inhalation of chemicals that uh, off-gas from turf fields. In addition, youth have higher su surface area to body mass ratio to, uh, to heat injuries that have been observed on artificial turf fields. Lastly, children and young adults have more future years of life over which to develop chronic diseases. So they say that the artificial turf, um, the existing studies do not comprehensively evaluate the concerns about health risks from exposure to them. Extremely few studies have examined the composition and safety of alternative infills, including those purported to be, quote, natural. A US uh, EPA report found research supporting the safety of alternative inf infills, such as, I don't even know what this stands for, capital EPDM or capital TPE, and plant-based, I know you're considering that, infills lacking or limited Indeed, the little information available regarding the composition and safety of these newer generation infill makes it impossible to assess safety. In addition, the grass blades, mats, and other components util utilized in all synthetic turf fields have not been thoroughly studied for composition and safety. 
So Time. the finding is, un until the findings of these studies are available and conclusively demonstrate the safety of artificial services, we recommend a moratorium on the use of these materials where children play. So thank you very much, Patty. This is what this is what the experts are saying on the safety of using artificial turf. Thank you so much. Okay. Not to mention the fact that CO2 can't get absorbed underneath. Excuse me. I'll take care of things. Thank you very much. Dr. Salvo Infantino, Six Betty Court. Three minutes is going to be impossible to be Salvo, able to Salvo, could you speak a little closer to the mic? Oh. Thank you so much. Okay. Sal Dr. Salvo Infantino, Six Betty Court. Um, you hear me now? Uh, three minutes is not going to be sufficient for me to address this very complicated subject, but I will simply tell the council that building a, a field where children are going to be playing next to a very busy highway is very, very deleterious to their health. The, there's a particular pollution that is created at a highway that's different than the pollution such as carbon dioxide that, that is spread worldwide. Within a radius of about 100 or 150 meters from that highway, heavy particles are, are sprayed over that area. Uh, the tires are hitting the, uh, the asphalt, pieces, you know, your tires get consumed, and that, that, that rubber ends up in, in the lungs of the children that are playing there. The brakes and the lining, uh, when, the, when the trucks are, are uh, putting their brakes on, pieces of metal are spewed into the air and the children are breathing it in. And children, as my wife has said just before, have a particular physiology. Their physiology puts them at greater risk for all these dangers. It is like you were going to put cigarettes uh, machines in, in, the, in the schools and have kids go smoking again. We know it was one thing before we knew the dangers of smoking. It's another after we did. So uh, I'll simply say to the council that I know a million studies have done and you've considered many different things, but I've never heard an independent medical expert speak to you about the dangers of this project that you have. And so I, I implore you to uh, get a, a, an expert to come here and discuss with you. Don't listen to me, but listen to an expert so that when you vote and make this decision, it will be based on, on information that is medically sound. So I, that's all I want to say to you is, before you make this decision, please get an independent medical expert to talk to you about what you're about to do and to what you're voting on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salvo. Can you hear me? Okay. My name's Christina. I live at uh, 530 West Saddle River Road. Your last name, Christina? Uh, Christina Million. Thank I, you. I live at 530 West Saddle River Road in Ridgewood. The community near Shedler supports the approved plan for the 75 by 50 multi-purpose field, and we would like to see it completed this year as scheduled. I do, however, have concerns about the idea of reopening the plan and making changes. Specifically, I would like to address the potential traffic issues that could arise from a larger field and the impact this could have on nearby residents. As you are aware, a larger field would allow for high school and adult league games, in introducing buses from other teams and games played after dark, causing traffic and parking problems on the street. And this is a real concern for our community. Eight years ago, in 2015, a very limited traffic assessment of West Saddle River Road was conducted by our local police, not an expert third party. This was included in the site development study dated October 7th, 2015, and it only covered a narrow time frame of 1 to 2 p.m. on some days, and peak traffic hours were defined as 10 to 4, which does not reflect the impact of expanded field options during rush hour or later. Additionally, the study was conducted during June and August, and we know that many residents are on vacation during this time. To properly assess the impact of a field expansion, a comprehensive analysis should be done by an external expert that covers peak traffic hours and considers various transportation modes that would impact our neighborhood, including buses, shuttles, cars, and ride-sharing services. For a quick comparison, in 2021, the borough of Paramus hired Stonefield Engineering and Design to conduct a traffic impact study to add a proposed gas stations to the BJ's Wholesale Club. That study was done over multiple days in February, included rush hour, and used modern software for data collection. 
West Saddle River Road is a crucial route for Ridge Road residents in this area without any alternative options. And when accidents occur on Route 17, cars and trucks are rerouted onto this road, causing significant delays of up to 20 to 30 minutes just to exit driveways and get our kids to school. And speaking of kids, it's time to prioritize the safety of the kids in our neighborhood. Drivers go from 55 miles per hour on Route 17 to a 25 mile per hour zone quickly, posing a safety risk with increased traffic. In the 2015 traffic study, our own local police cited that everyone speeds. There are no sidewalks along the Shedler property, there are no speed bumps, and there are no crosswalks. I urge you to bring the park to life as soon as possible with the 75 by 50 yard field. And for those that ran in support of it, stay true to your word. Thank you very much, Christina. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, my voice is a little funny today. My name is Fretra De Silva. I live at 521 West Saddle River Road. I'm here to speak about Shedler. I actually want to speak about two particular issues with regards to the park, and that is a proper uh, due process and process around this issue, and secondly, transparency. <coughs> um, along with um, the plan that was adopted in 2018, I understood that there have been or there were certain studies that were conducted. They may have been internal, but there was some effort that was made. It's not clear to everyone, I think, currently that a similar process is being followed. Uh, maybe similar to other projects in town where you employ third parties to look at the issues, to analyze the, the issue, the problem, and, and various solutions. Um, while I believe the community is in support of the existing plan and moving forward and closing that existing plan, I would say that any reopening of that plan should require a new analysis. Uh, if it's traffic, the study was eight years ago. We're not even sure what kind of health and safety, other health and safety studies have been conducted. Uh, my second point goes to that, and I think uh, Matt spoke to some of the other studies or third party analysis engineers uh, that could be employed. My second point is transparency. This is an important issue to the town, and I would suggest that the council potentially put an extra tab on the website uh, temporarily housing all of the information regarding the Shetler property issues so that people know what is the plan, what was the adopted 2018 plan, what is the difference, and they can see the plans. Um, you know, we see on the screen for a few minutes what the in engineer has proposed, but that's diff difficult for a layperson. It would be nice to see it and be able to study it. I think we are in support of the 75 to 50 um, uh, park, but what does that mean? Are there runoffs? Are there safety nets? What does that mean for parking? What will that look like? And so I believe that would be very helpful to the average citizen to really understand what's going on, um, and I would ask you to consider that. And lastly, in that regard, I think budgeting is, is also an issue. It would be nice to have everything in one place, not only um, the work you've done, the work that's being done, um, you know, how that will look, but also how we're going to afford it as a town. Uh, this is, if once we reopen the plan and make uh, new changes to that, if it requires studies, et cetera, you know, how are we paying for that? Uh, and I think that's an issue for all, all of the citizens of, of Ridgewood. Thank you. Thank you, Fritja. Ryan Graney, 293 South Pleasant Avenue. Uh, good evening, council members and fellow Ridgewood residents. Like I said, my name is Ryan Graney. I moved to Ridgewood in 1992 before uh, my sophomore year of high school. And after graduating Ridgewood High School in 1995, the thought was I wanted to get away and live anywhere else as a kid who would when they're on their own for the first time. Well, realizing what anywhere else is like, my wife Julie and I knew that we really wanted the chance to live here. In 2006, we bought our first home here. Uh, we're blessed to have two boys, a sophomore at RHS and an eighth grader at BF. Our boys love living here in Ridgewood. It's a decision that we've never regret. In addition to a lot of things, they love sports and specifically baseball. Their interest in the sport not only grew my excitement about the game, but it got me into coaching and then at an early age and then sparked something in me with the need to give more, which led me to being a trustee for the RBSA since 2014. I've held a few roles in a great organization, including 
travel baseball commissioner, and now heading up our rec baseball program. Sure, there's been a few things along the way of concern, but the one thing that's always come back to us in an area that I hear the most from our players, families, and coaches is the fields and the, the lack of fields and the condition of our fields. Anyone in town who has kids participating in the sport will tell you that fields are an issue. Again, either the lack thereof or the field conditions. Baseball and softball are unique to the other sports in that you just really can't set up anywhere in a cones and a goal and play. The majority of the fields we use are shared and are overused. I get it, there's a lot of sport options for our kids, but there's only so much space. Having another field can alleviate that stress on what we currently have. That's why if we have the chance to develop space for the use of baseball and softball, we should and we need to. Do I think that we have, should have a couple of baseball and softball only fields? Yes, but that's another conversation. I don't think anyone here in attendance, virtually or on the village council, wants to get this wrong and harm those that live in the Shedler neighborhood. There are agreements and concessions that can be made to meet in the middle. We are one town of one big neighborhood. But from what I see is my responsibility to not only my kids and to that of the program uh, that many of our residents have children participating in, we need another field. I ask that we all consider the need and the middle ground to find it and meet there. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Hi, I'm Jean Tyson, 354 Fairfield Avenue. I'm here because I just want to make a couple of comments on Shedler. And one of the things is I think that we need to make sure that we're using logic in the conversation. We don't necessarily need to go and spend a lot of money on a lot of studies. We know that the road is very narrow over there. We know there's a lot of traffic over there. We know that people are coming off 17 at a high rate of speed and they're going quickly over in that area. And so we know those are high concerns and planning should take those things into consideration. I think it's important that when we put together a plan for what's gonna happen there, we need to make sure there's ample parking because we don't want people parking on the street and then walking down a narrow street where there are a lot of traffic issues. I mean, that's just another very logical thing that we don't need to pay somebody in a study in order to be able to do this. To the little bit that I understand, the previous council submitted a proposal that a lot of people are talking about as the approved plan. And that was submitted for approval for us to proceed on and it was rejected, if I understand that correctly. And so I look at it and I say, okay, as was just suggested a few minutes ago, maybe it would be good for us to have something on the website that we can look at because this council has been very good with transparency and I'd like it to continue. Can we have something that's up there that says, this is the challenge in the current situation and these are the situations that we're trying to resolve. I think it's reasonable that the baseball group teams want a, another large field, totally reasonable. It would be wonderful if all of our current fields didn't flood there would be a lot of great things that we can do. We can only resolve so many issues, and I just think we should be um, careful but transparent in the way that we're communicating this process. Thanks, Jean. Denise Lima, 319 <clears throat> East Glen Ave here to talk about the resolution 18-236 that was approved for the 2017 Shedler Field and Compromise. Um, Mayor, thanks for meeting with the neighbors um, over in that area and having the Saturday sessions. Um, I think what we're all here to just talk about a little bit is the analysis that needs to get done or that we haven't seen. When I have presentations made to me on different projects at work, um, it's not what they say that I really pay attention to because usually people do their due diligence. It's actually what we're not hearing. Um, and I agree that I don't think over engineering and spending money is, is needed, but we do need to understand um, what are the statistics of the older children that are be, gonna, gonna be coming in and the scheduling. We should have some idea on a daily basis um, what that turnover will be like and what's going to happen to the younger children that we were going to put in these smaller fields. Um, what are the costs? We haven't even talked about, nobody's broached the house. 
which isn't even fixed yet. So what are the costs for that? When are we going to finish that before we jump into something new for the fields? Again, it's what we're not hearing. Um, safety and traffic, parking um, was all discussed. Both sides, one side, can you make a left-hand turn? Where is the county in their voice in this? We, we haven't heard the county. We haven't heard parks and recs come and talk about what they think, which has you know, been so important on other topics. Um, and then I, I can't help to think about 15 times we talked about Shedler on the agenda last year. And not once did Pam, Paul, or Lorraine you uh, all there talk about flooding, talk about field size for Shedler. You had 15 opportunities, and it, and it never came up, and I don't understand why. I don't understand why we have council members with pledges about saving money, cost, hurry up and do Shedler on 2017, and then completely saying something different. I don't think it's, what's, what's your words, fighting for fairness and justice? I mean, the, it's the things I'm not hearing the empathy for the neighbors, what's in it for them? What are they going to get out of it? I think we all want a win-win situation. We love kids outdoors, not in the house, on the computers, but it's the things we're not hearing in that analysis um, besides the site plan that I think we'd all like to better understand. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And Lori, hang on just a second. We've got somebody on hybrid that we're gonna bring in. We're gonna go till 8.15. Um, and if we have more people on hybrid, we'll go further. I beg your pardon? No, um, Denise is number 10. That was 10. Okay. And, but, I, but right now we don't have many people on, so we'll, we'll probably get back to you. So, um, James, are you on the line? James? James, are you on the line? We will continue in person, and if James comes back, we will reintroduce him. Lori. Thank you. Lori Weber, 235 South Irving Street. To understand why village manager Heather Maylander was pressured by village council, council leadership to resign, a few things must be brought to light. The village has an unenforceable ordinance on its books, the product of a court order sought by the members of one village, one vote. Ordinance 3048 establishes the date of both school and municipal elections in November. As these people continue to revel in their victory, there is an important piece of this that continues to be overlooked by them, by the courts, and by the village council that has now led to what can only be seen as political retribution targeting Ms. Maylander. No matter when the school elections take place, the fact remains that the village council is not empowered to establish the date of school elections by ordinance. Doing so conflicts with state law, specifically the Title 19 statutes regarding the Board of Education and the public's rights and powers in the timing of school elections. Ordinance 3048 strips our Board of Education of its statutory authority over its own elections, transferring that power solely to the Village Council, which uncoincidentally now includes a core one village, one vote member and three of her supporters. Ms. Maylander was not advised of this. This ordinance also conflicts with a previous court order that specified certain seats on the Board of Education must be up for election on specific months and years through 2022. Because of that conflict, we no longer have our lawfully required annual Board of Education elections, and yet none of these hypocrites, not one of these self-proclaimed champions of elections, has taken issue with that, yet they lay blame on Ms. Maylander. Ms. Winograd's unfounded assertions that Ms. Excuse Maylander me, Lori, tried- it, it, Excuse it, it, me, uh, Lori, and this is to- I everyone. know what you're going to say. Excuse Just me. let me finish my sentence. I'm not talking about her as a, as a council member. I'm excuse talking about me. something that happened before. I'm going to ask, this is our policy, <sighs> and this has always been our policy. When you come up here, you can speak to the council. You can speak to the council generally. 
please do not name any individual council members or you will not be permitted to continue. And I'm going to tell you, and I hope this is not part of my three minutes, that the, 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 what I was referring to was something that Ms. Winograd did as a Lori, resident. I'm going to ask you for the last Fine. time. A certain council member's assertions that Ms. Maylander tried to sabotage her petition have led to her council supporters to sabotage Ms. Maylander's livelihood. The village has failed Ms. Maylander by not properly informing her or defending her, leading to this vindictive act of political retribution being sold to the public as an administrative decision. Ms. Maylander is the only innocent in all of this, victimized by all sides of this ugly mess, and yet her accusers are apparently still not satisfied. She has served our community well as our dedicated, tireless, and most excellent village manager. She is being punished for the misdeeds of others. I hope she will stand up to the intimidation and reclaim her position. Let the community see if these bullies are willing to wrongfully terminate her. And I would have to add to that that I have sat through many of these meetings and listened to the former mayor's name be invoked over and over and over again. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And we're going to try and reconnect with James. James, are you there? James? You're on mute. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Oh, yay. <laughs> Sorry. Yay. Sorry about that. Yeah, hi. Um, James is my son. Ah, got um, it. <laughs> your name and address, please. <laughs> All right, yes. My name is Susan Ruan. I live at 705 Kingsbridge Lane. I'm sorry, your last um, name, Susan? Um, Ruan. Got it. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All good. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about important topics to the residents on my side of Ridgewood. Um, first, the Chandler property and the proposal for the bigger field. It is not clear that a big field met the big field meets the actual need. The residents would like the council per, to provide the village with the detailed assessment of field needs for the town teams. The 60 foot teams are used for children in fifth grade and lower and the 90 foot um, large fields are used for teams in the middle school and higher. There are more children playing sports when they are younger than versus older. When my daughter did the Maroons for many years, Children as young as four years old can start participating in the Maroons sports, then compete on competitive teams when they are seven. When my daughter was on the Maroons, there were three or four travel teams for each age group and sex for children under the um, fifth grade and lower, thus approximately 30, 30, I mean 24 to 30 competitive teams, plus all the small children ages four to six who also use the small fields. Many teens drop out of sports when they enter middle schools. When my daughter was in the, in the club, the Maroons teams shrank to combine age groups, and there were only eight teams between the boys and girls playing in middle school. Even though there are higher demands for children in fifth grade and younger for small fields, according to the Maroons um, website, there are more designated large fields in Ridgewood than small ones. According to their website, there are only three designated small fields in Ridgewood, Citizens Orchard and Travel, five designated large fields, Glen Hawes, the high school, Somerville and Brookside, and five combo of large and small, Vets, M Mabel, BF, Huppernickel, and Stevens. Thus, the need for an additional small fields are much greater than the actual need for a large field. The small field, which was per approved in 2018, would be a better response to the demand um, for fields. In the December 7th, 2022 council meeting, the village engineer stated that he worked with SHPO for a year on designing the smaller field. 
um, on Shedler and that the plan was going to be submitted to them by the end of 2022. The second item is East Saddle River footbridge. It is, um, it has come to my attention that a minor was involved in an accident riding his bike on East Saddle River Road in Hohokus because the footbridge was closed. Thankfully, the child is okay. Time. All right. Thank you, Susan. We have Thank you. Some, we have someone else on hybrid, Ellie Gruber. Hi, good evening. Hi. Hi. Good evening. It's Ellie Gruber, 229 South Irvin Street. Sorry, I got a, I got a bad feedback. I'd like to address my comments to the parents of the young children who were promised a medium-sized soccer field so they could play. That field would be up and running by either late summer or fall. Now, with your new plan, they have no dedicated field. The parents and coaches for the older kids won't see any field for at least a few years as a completely new application has to go through many iterations. Second, there is a need for another traffic study by an expert, not by a village employee who is not impartial and definitely not as far back as 2015. Further, it should not be done in June or August when school is out and no consideration of the increased traffic as baseball fields with more cars and even buses will crowd the streets and homes. More parking spaces, fewer trees, possibility of lights, and no safe playground. You will be causing more confusion as permits will be requested, SHPO has to be notified, and hearings held. Why are you undoing an agreed upon plan? Listening to parents who in all likelihood will move away once their kids graduate. We need to complete the plan that was years in the making, not to please a group that will always want more and more. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. We are over on time, but we're gonna take one more comment from the room. Thank you. Beth Gold Kreller, 719 Belmont Road. I'm here on behalf of Green Ridgewood. In response to the Ridgewood Master Plan, we've created new subcommittees to address key master plan recommendations we feel Green Ridgewood can support via education and action. Additional committee members can help us execute initiatives strategically aligned with the revised Ridgewood Master Plan across three key areas. Green building and sustainability, this includes electrification measures. Holistic resource management, this includes recycling initiatives. And finally, stormwater management strategies. Please increase the size of Green Ridgewood from six to eight members. This will enable the group to function at a high level and provide the type of guidance that will enable current and future planning board and village councils to get the appropriate advice and solutions to address challenges the village faces. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. I'm now going to close public comment. Can, can I re request that we, how many people want to speak? Two more? Can you raise your hands if you want to speak? Four, five. So and, that's 15 minutes. We have for, always, always allowed, when there's a hot topic issue, we go on. We do not, people are coming here to speak. Let's honor them. Let's let them speak, please. We've always done it before. Forgive me, Lorraine, and forgive me, all of you. Um, we are going to close public comment and continue with our meeting. You always say you want to hear from the people. The people are here. They want to talk to you. And, and you're cutting them, and I wanna, cutting them off. I, I am not cutting them off. I extended public comment beyond our time limit. And I want to thank everyone who came tonight because your comments, your criticisms, your support, all of your opinions, regardless of what they are, are so important in this very, very difficult issue. Um, 
I've said something before and I'm going to say it again tonight. Everyone in this room is absolutely right. Those of you who want a multi-purpose lacrosse, soccer, football, baseball field for the children who need it because of flooding and the lack of field space, you're absolutely right. Those of you who say that this isn't the best place to put this field are absolutely right. Those of you who say that every single tree needs to be preserved are absolutely right. Unfortunately, this village of unseemingly, or excuse me, excuse me, of seemingly unlimited potential has very limited resources to satisfy all of you who are here tonight, which is why we need to work together as a community to share our limited resources for the benefit of our children and the people of the Shedler neighborhood. We cannot fail this neighborhood or our community's children. We need to stop taking sides. We need to work together to find a solution to this problem. Thank you very much. We need to hear everybody speak Excuse and me, see Paul, what they I, have to say. I, I, I Excuse me? Excuse me. I'm clo I have closed public comment. We're going to go to the manager's report. Paul, I'd like to respond to By all means. OK. Um, I, I have several things I'd like to respond. Um, on the matter regarding Ms. Maylander, I've recused myself from any of those decisions. If anybody ever has any questions of that, our lawyer, I have recused. Uh, on, it's not on. It is on. Can anyone hear me now? Yeah. Okay. With respect to the one village, one vote in the matter of Ms. Maylander, I was recused from that decision. Um, that's, you know, Matt sitting right here. I've been recused from that decision, so there is no retaliation. With respect to several of the questions, the, the granular questions, I want to make sure that everyone understands a couple things since I, you know, my campaign flyer was held up and I want to be clear. Upon being elected, I have, I found out that the 2017 plan that was submitted and approved by the council was never submitted to SHPO. And several things were materially changed, okay? There were two subsequent plans submitted to SHPO, which is state oversight. All of them have dates. I've asked that they all be put on the website. So sometime between 2017 and my taking office, there were two subsequent plans that were materially changed. Not just the field, okay? The easement into the park, it moved from Terhune Road, closer to Route 17 to Queensbridge. There was an addition of a structure for lightning. And all these changes occurred when I was a member of the public outside of public light. So upon taking office, the first thing we need to do is let people know that the plan that was foundational for the decision making had been altered. SHPO had received changes. You, you'll see on the new plan, the, the most striking thing to me was the 2017 plan, which was 5-0 vote, said a couple things. It would be entrance on Terhune. It's now at Queensbridge. So that's a big change for the neighborhood, which I felt the neighborhood needed to know. The rejected plans that had, over, one was overdeveloped and one had an emphasis on the park. They're all listed on the Shedler project tab. So any bit of information that I have found out is listed. All of the engineering drawings have a date and you can see there. So when we're talking about this, there is no approval from SHPO. In order to go to SHPO, the council has to say yes. In order for the council to say yes, we need to make the public aware of what's going on. So if everybody looks at that tab, everything is listed. Everything that I can get my hands on is there. If people are missing information, let me know, because I too have questions as to how the plan was changed and when was it changed. Added to that, people asked about the expenses. Um, we've been taking, you know, since taking office, I've been concerned about the expense. We're undergoing the budget process, and the budget ask regarding the remaining balance of Shedler, the remaining balance was 500,000, and the reason why is a bulk of the project has already been bonded. The way that our capital budget works is that it, the bond is issued and it can carry over. Nine bonds for a total, for the whole project, totaling $7 million have been issued for, for Shedler. Appro approximately, and this is give or take because there's some mistakes on this that we went over the other day, $5 million has been paid, leaving with us with a balance that's already been bonded, that the taxpayers are already paying, of $1.9 million. I've asked the CFO to put this up on the website and he needs some time to straighten it out. Um, there were some changes between where the berm was and things like that. So that information is going to be made. We picked St. Patrick's Day because it seemed outside the budget. So all of the funding minus $500,000 for the plan 
has already been bonded and the taxpayers have been looking at it. Um, and I think that's it. If anybody has any questions, one of the things that I have, a, I have an email, people can write me. I get a little concerned when people start you know, sort of saying something that I said, yes, I supported the 2017 plan. But upon taking office, I found information that I feel the public needs to know. It would be completely irresponsible, in my opinion, and I think the council agrees, to put a plan forth to ship out with a different entrance to the park, different parking, a bathroom, a lightning alert. All of that is different. So when you look and you see this plan, somehow the previous council, and I'm moving forward, changed it. It has been materially changed, not just with the field. And that's not casting stones, it's providing information. When you look at the budget, the taxpayers, bonding is super expensive. It's very expensive. It's a driver to you know, your taxes. $7 million has been spent already. It's already paid for. It's like credit in the bank. And those numbers sort of are astounding. Um, so if people want that information, please let me know. I'll speak more to you know what we went through, but I think the whole council, I, I'm hoping everybody agrees, the purpose of having a public meeting is so we can provide public information. And having been in the seat for eight weeks, I've learned a lot. You know, I think it's somewhat shocking that the 2017 plan never made its way to the state. And the reality is there is no plan in place until SHEPO says yes, and we don't have SHEPO's blessing. So if you have questions about that, please let me know. Um, I love it when someone writes me, and one of the, the emails that I got was that, how are you changing it to turf? The 2017 plan was turf on page 10. So I'm not here you know, to argue with people or be unempathetic. Clearly, when I walked around the property for Shedler, we all feel for the neighbors. It, you know, in my honest opinion, what's been left there over the five years is an eyesore. I think you deserve better. I think you deserve a park with a playground, and we can talk more about that. But the project tab is under Shedler. The finances, because there's some inconsistencies that need to just be changed, you know, buckets, it needs to go to the house versus this, will be available March 17th. And if you want more public information in terms of drawings, we'll all provide that. And if you have any questions, just please write us, and, and I'm here for that. Any information I can get, I will give you. Thanks, Siobhan. And by the way, for those of you who want to make public comment, we have public comment at the end of the meeting, and I invite you all to come at the end of the meeting or stay, and we are happy to hear all of your comments at that time. Thank you so much. And there is no time limit at the end of the meeting, And correct? there is no time limit at the end of the meeting. So, and you so get you to speak for five minutes in. instead of three. So it's even longer. Uh, let's move on to the manager's report. Okay. Um, council chat is held on the first Saturday of every month. Uh, the next council chat is scheduled for Saturday, March 4th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. here in the Village Hall courtroom. Please call for a reservation, 201-670-5500, extension 2207. Walk-ins are welcome. However, reservations have priority. Uh, there is a trip to the Philadelphia Flower Show on Tuesday, March 7th. It's called the Garden Electric. Uh, bus transportation and entrance to the show is $80 per person. You may register online at um, do community pass or in person at the stable, make checks out to Ridgewood Parks and Recreation. A summer job fair will be held on March 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Annie Zuzi Youth Center in the community center here at the ground floor of Village Hall. It will be focused on young adults, 16 and older for summer employment. There will be a wide variety of employment opportunities presented. Um, those who attend may speak with supervisors who can answer their questions. They will also be able to learn requirements for each position. Um, household hazardous waste collection event, Bergen County Utilities Authority. Um, you can take uh, your hazardous waste to that location, which is at the foot of Empire Boulevard in Munaki. Um, they accept aerosol cans, antifreeze, batteries, ba blacktop stealers, all tape, types of paint and varnishes, photography, uh, chemicals, and it will be rain or shine and no commercial vehicles. Health, our health uh, department is sponsoring various programs with other partners. West Bergen Mental Health Care, Ridgewood Health Department and Ridgewood Parks and Recreation present how to spot school-based anxiety tools, tips, and techniques. This in-person workshop will include a discussion on signs, symptoms, and causes. 
as well as tangible coping strategies and resources for parents to help support their children. Um, March 8th, 7 to 8 p.m. in the Village Hall Senior Lounge. Registration is required through community pass and refreshments will be provided. March 30th from 10.30 a.m. to 12 noon, there will be an in-person workshop with the Alzheimer's Association. There's more to come on this program. And then uh, the Village Health Department staff have been visiting local child care facilities to present activities to wash their hands and not spread germs. The Project Pride Committee, which plant, plants flowers in the Central Business District and other areas in the village, and maybe um, rehabilitating our kissing balls for the um, Christmas season. The green team works on sustainability measures and applying to the state sustainable Jersey program to maintain our sustainable Jersey certification. And the Pride Day com Committee, which plans the event for our June celebration of the LGBTQ community are looking for members. Please fill out the citizen volunteer leadership form, which is found on the village website by clicking on the tile employment and volunteer opportunities and send it with a cover letter and resume indicating which committee you would like to serve on and why to Joyce Magro in the village clerk's office at jmagro at ridgewoodnj.net with the subject line volunteer for board committee. The village has recently uh, moved everyone's contact information who signed up for swift reach to a new emergency notification system everbridge if you wish to modify the contact information associated with your account please create a login by going to either ridgewoodnj.net or water.ridgewoodnj.net and click the red banner labeled village of ridgewood and ridgewood water emergency alert program if you not do not need to make any changes then you are already registered for future emergency notifications. Village Council meetings um, are broadcast here from the Village Hall courtroom. They're in person as well as on Zoom or by phone, and they're also on YouTube. March um, 1st and March 22nd and April 3rd are all work sessions. Please note in April it is on a Monday due to Passover on Wednesday. And then March 8th is the public meeting in um, March. In addition, budget meetings will be held uh, tomorrow night and also Friday night. Um, and then the last one is scheduled for March 6th at 5 p.m. They're all at 5 p.m. They're here in the courtroom, and we also have it available by Zoom. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Heather. We're going to move to council reports. Evan? Great. I'll be brief. Just want to really congratulate the uh, Ridgewood Symphony Orchestra. Really wonderful performance the other night. Um, I was in attendance with members of my family. Absolutely fantastic. The clarinet concerto was just fantastic. Um, full House, really one of the things that um, really makes Ridgewood unique. Um, and really just want to congratulate them for putting on a wonderful, wonderful show. Thank you so much. Lorraine? Thank you. Citizen Safety Advisory Committee met on February 16th. The Franklin Avenue corridor repaving and markings are complete. The county review of our corridor concept plan continues and we are waiting for their response. The village completed the upgrade of pedestrian signals and conduit work at the Oak Street intersection. Safe routes to school construction will hopefully begin in 2023. The Glen Avenue sidewalk plans have been completed for um, Glen Avenue, I was waiting back. I'm hoping Chris is here tonight. He could probably tell us. I'm not sure whether there is a concept completed for the Glen Avenue sidewalks from Maple Ave all the way up or if it starts after the underpass. I need to get confirmation from that. Um, In-street pedestrian crossing sign has been installed at Franklin Turnpike and Nagel Street. Officer Torino reported that there are plans to purchase up to 10 additional stop for pedestrian and the crosswalk signs. They are, some of them will be used to replace damaged ones and some will be added to new locations. The village is evaluating additional street lighting and in-street pedestrian crossing signs at East Glen and Bogart Avenue. A resident that came to the meeting reported a sight distance and visibility issue at Garber Square involving the keep right sign and the bollards at the median in the island. She said, you know, if she's standing there, she doesn't feel that cars can see her because the sign is right at her head height. Um, the resident suggested the need for a separate turn 
phase signal and pedestrian interval to reduce potential pedestrian and vehicle, vehicular conflicts. The engineering department will review and offer any practical measures to address that issue. Engineering reported plans to resurface the side streets of Chestnut, Oak, and Walnut between East Ridgewood and Franklin Avenue during the summer of 2023. So they will all be repaved because they're in pretty bad shape. The CSEC committee also discussed with Officer Torino the need to review certain intersections having right turn on red signs where conditions for pedestrians are challenging. Maybe they shouldn't have right turns on red. Uh, and the next meeting will be March 16th at 7.30 in the garden room. All are welcome. And I just want to apologize to anybody who made the effort to come down and speak and was turned away. I hope that it does not discourage you from waiting till the end of the meeting or going home and calling in or coming back again at another time. I don't feel that there should be a limit to public comment. I would like to hear what everybody has to say. And I, for me, I apologize to you if you came down here and you were not able to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Siobhan? Sure. I have quite an update. So on Valentine's Day, I spent the day with the Shade Tree Commission, and we went over many things. First of all, we're trying to establish bylaws. We have three new terms, and we picked a bylaw subchair. George Wolfson's going to be adding that up. We discussed the budget, and I think the general sense is that last year, Shade Tree had a large ask for our capital, and we had some rollover money. So this year, during the budget processing, there's going to be you know, a little bit less coming that way. And as an advocate for Shade Tree, I promised my committee I would say, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of Shade Tree. The Emerald Ash Borer is still doing a lot of damage. Um, the Central Business District will be complete this year when the remaining tree streets are planted. But we need to continue, as a council, to support the Shade Tree both with budget and effort. We also discussed um, alternate sources of revenue, increasing the public's awareness that we're always looking for money for trees and trying to inspire people to plant trees on their own homelands because that is very effective. On, on February 15th, um, Council Member Reynolds and I took a tour of the Shedler House. One of the things that I've been concerned with, and I think the rest of the council was, that the house has been largely undiscussed since we took office, and I was curious to see it. Um, I somewhat insisted that I go on a field trip, and Lorraine went with me. Um, I wanted to say that the house, which has been a recipient of $2.3 million, is still unfinished. Um, the inside is a work in progress. The day we were there, um, there were no workers there, but they are working on it. And at this point, at, there's no future intended use for the house, which is something that we're going to be discussing as a council. Because once complete, we'll need to make sure that the house is safe and maintained, and we're going to need to talk about who can go in there and when. For now, the house is closed to the public. We really don't want people going in because the construction is so rough. Um, please don't go into the house. Um, Okay, the other thing is that uh, with the money that we discussed with Shedler at that meeting, we talked about applying for several grants, not just for the house, but also the parkland. We've received some money for the house from grants that hasn't all come in to be offset, so we don't have the calculation on that, but we are looking to also apply for additional grants for the field, the park, and things like that. Um, again, if anybody has any questions about that, you can write us. On, on February 16th, I attended a mo uh, meeting with the neighboring town of Glen Rock, and Glen Rock uh, has an organization called CRAN, which is Community Relations Action Network, and they are recommending that um, each municipality do a community read, and the read is how the word is passed. Our library is sponsoring this. It's a book. There's satellite group chats that you can go in. They're being led by local clergy and local people who this is a passion play for them. So if anybody has any questions, I know that the library posted it. Um, and then on Friday, I went to several meetings. Um, I am the access liaison, and while I was at at access with the housing development we have a significant number of special needs adults living within the community and now that they are living here they're looking for additional employment and we discussed some ideas for pot potential sources of employment one of the ideas that they were discussing about is a bakery that employs them we are, I'm going on a field trip to look at it and we are looking to see if the village has any assets where they could walk 
clearly, you know, living in town, being walkable. If anybody knows of any space that would be available for any type of business that could help the special needs community, that would be wonderful. Um, after that meeting, I went to a meeting with the American Legion representative that is launching an initiative akin to Hometown Heroes, where if your city of birth and registration for the military is Ridgewood, there are going to be placard flags on the, on the lampposts. We are waiting for the details from them and the cost for them, but it's a beautiful presentation. So for someone like me, my uncle and my father both registered for the, my uncle and my brother for the Navy, you can sponsor a person with an image, and Joan Monta is going to be handling that, and she will be here for a future presentation. After that meeting, we had a meeting that Heather referenced with um, members of our community who are wishing to support Pride in terms of a date and a celebration. And as we said, we're going to be assembling a Pride committee. I believe that will be on the agenda next week for discussion. But anybody who has any interest should apply for an application and send it to Heather Maylander. And then on Saturday, um, as a very sweet treat, I attended the opening of Chip City, which is next to Jersey Mike's, and it's delicious, and we were very glad to see them. The Ridgewood High School band was there to welcome them, and I encourage everybody to treat themselves to one of these cookies. They were delicious, and last night we had another subcommittee with communications, and we all enjoyed them. And lastly, I did want to say um, I did receive a letter uh, to be read onto the record, but because we're not taking future public comment, I'm going to read it at the end. We have no policy on letter writing, but I want to be fair, so I don't want to read this letter until the end comment. So I have a letter to be read at the end. Thank you, Siobhan. Pam? Good evening. I'd like to give you an update on EAGER. EAGER stands for Encouraging Alternative Green, Ridge, Green Energy for Ridgewood. This is our plan. Um, that the council approved and we hope to launch it in 2023 with the goal of using residents bulk purchasing power to procure electric power uh, from uh, on behalf of the residents with a higher renewable content and at a lower price than what we're getting from PSE and G. Gable Associates, which is our energy agent, has been closely monitoring the energy market for savings opportunities and um, Eager will go out to market as soon as conditions warrant and will notify residents uh, if and when a contract is signed and the program becomes active. Green Ridgewood also met uh, and we had uh, long discussions about the master plan um, and Subcommittees are really getting very active now. Uh, one group met with school representatives um, on various environmental topics. Another subcommittee met on stormwater management. We have a lot of work to do there. Also, uh, Ms. Maylander mentioned the green team, and the green team is responsible for submitting our application that outlines everything the village has done in terms of environmental protection and conservation. And um, this year, we, we didn't get silver certification. We only got bronze certification, which was a bit of a disappointment. But uh, this, this week, because the group has been working so hard, we are resubmitting our application and hope to reclaim our cer silver certification. There are uh, a couple of vacancies on that team, and it's really fun work. So I hope you all will consider applying. Jamboree uh, put on wonderful performances this year. It was, it was kind of hard to sit still in the seats because the dancing and the music was so wonderful. They raised over, well over $200,000 for scholarships for Ridgewood High School graduates. And boy, every year the sets and the costumes get more and more spectacular. Um, so it was just a great event. Make sure you catch it next year. The Open Space Committee met and discussed master plan action items also. Uh, we are planning the joint uh, committee meeting with uh, the Parks and Rec Conservation Board for April, hopefully. And uh, we're also going to extend an invitation to meet jointly with the Historic Preservation Committee. Uh, in terms of what's going on downtown, I did want to mention the fashion show that took place on Friday night at Heart of Motion Dance Studio, featuring great outfits from Fembot, the little shop on, on Hudson Street. Um, 
and there were so many businesses that collaborated. It wasn't just the dress shop and the dance studio. There was also gold, uh, uh, Bazaar Star Beatery that had a table with all their crystals and things that was really interesting. And um, Lovato Eyewear provided some pretty outrageous eyeglasses for the, uh, for the models. So that was really nice to see. And that's all I have. Thanks, Pam. Um, I met with the Stigma Free Committee this week, um, still one of my favorite all-time groups because they do such great work for our community. Um, they recently, actually our health department recently applied for a $140,000 grant that's pending so that they can hire a consultant um, uh, to offer training uh, on diversity, equity, and inclusion for all of our village employees. That grant would also cover uh, services and workshops during the annual spring into, into health and wellness season and a bunch of other really great things. So keep your fingers crossed and let's hope we get that grant. Um, also, they want to let everyone know that um, uh, uh, last month uh, the president declared the end of the COVID-19 health emergency. And what that means is um, a lot of things, but the thing that's going to hit home for most of us is that the free public testing kits after May 11th will no longer be free. So uh, be aware of that as you proceed forward. There's lots of detail on that. You know, they're free in certain instances, not free in others, but uh, again, just be aware of that as we proceed. Uh, also, the health department does this great, great program called Cards of Joy, where they send cards, handwritten cards, to um, the most vulnerable of our communities, um, shut-ins, disabled um, seniors, um, and um, everyone can participate. So if you'd like, uh, we are still collecting cards up through February 27th, and there are mailboxes here in Village Hall and at the library. So it's really a great, great program. Uh, there are also a bunch of other um, seminars that they, they are working, uh, working on and distributing. Uh, one is how to spot school-based anxiety tools, tips, and techniques. Uh, and if you'd like to find out more about that, uh, you can call the health department at 201-670-5500, extension 2312. There's also the community impact of COVID-19 for caregivers um, and, and how it has adversely affected them. If you're interested in this workshop, again, 670-5500, uh, extension 2312. Um, and at the Liber uh, excuse me, the Ridgewood Library, there will be a job center event hosted by the Adult Services Department. Um, you can reach out to the library or check their website for that. There's also another program at the library. Aging Unbound for May is Older American Month. Um, so if you're interested in that, again, check the library's website. Uh, Valley Health Systems is sponsoring several very good uh, workshops. Um, Thrive is a free membership program for women of all ages to take charge of their wellness, improve their health for their families, and set time aside for themselves. If you're interested, you can call 201-291-6264. Uh, there's also an intuitive eating virtual workshop being held on March 6th, um, which is for nurturing the body rather than restricting food to lose weight. Uh, and although weight loss can be a byproduct of eating intuitively. So if you're interested in this, you can go on to uh, Valley's website to find out more. Another program sponsored by Valley, Kids and Social Media, What Parents Should Know and What They Can Do. So if you're interested in that, you can also contact Valley, uh, check their website. Talking, about, uh, talking to kids about food, energy, and their health, also a Valley-sponsored workshop. Just go to their website. And at the Bergen Newbridge Medical Center, another program on healthy eating. Uh, and you can contact Corinne Scarpa at 201-961-9256. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, before our presentations this evening, we're going to go to item D2 under policy, which is concerning the Zoning Board of Adjustments annual report for 2021. 
and the things that they would like to see um, changed. John Barry, our planner, is here. I'll have him come up in case there are any questions. So if you please go to item D2. And maybe um, Deputy Mayor Perrin and uh, Mr. Barry can give us an update and what it is that we're discussing. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Hi. Well, the, the Zoning Board of Adjustment every year puts out a, uh, an annual report. And from their experiences, they say they let the planning board and the village council know how we can improve our procedures and our zoning ordinances. And so last year, um, uh, their 2021 request had five requests, and we'll go through them. Um, the 2022 is not out yet, but these are very constructive suggestions. And so take it away, John. Sure. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. 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 Great. Um, so we've had an opportunity to discuss some of these issues during the preparation of the master plan and then more recently over the last month or so, month and a half, in beginning to talk with the planning board and others about the implementation process for some of the recommendations. We have started to look at a variety of different things related to the village's zoning ordinance. The issues raised by the zoning board include um, big picture, these are all things that the board finds itself struggling with issues of clarity in the ordinance and the meetings tend to drag on with back and forth that some of you may have experienced and they're trying to streamline their process essentially. And so it's a matter of trying to get a little more clarity for the board members and to improve the process for the residents, the homeowners, and the applicants who are coming before the board so they don't have to keep coming in, going back, redesigning things, and, and dealing with a back and forth that's time consuming and costly. So one of the um, first issues is how the village's ordinance treats driveways. Uh, there have been a lot of requests for expansions of driveways, different driveway designs, circular driveways, um, detached garages that may have two, three, or four bays, and the different widths of the driveways that need to accompany those. The ordinance lacks clarity in terms of the width that's permitted, so people end up with these questions, and there's reasonable disagreement because there's a gray area. Um, so as far as dealing with those issues, started to workshop some solutions and um, would look forward to bringing those back before the council in the form of an ordinance amendment that would define width at the street, width within the property, and then allow for the width necessary to access garage doors, and make, make all of those things crystal clear instead of having this one measurement that doesn't necessarily fit all. Um, another issue that's been raised and the board has seen some applications for front porches that come into the front setback a little bit. So they go too close to the street based on what's allowed by the ordinance. In a lot of neighborhoods in Ridgewood, that's, there are existing conditions where many homes have porches and it tends to be a desirable aesthetic where that, that, that contributes to the streetscape, it contributes to the quality of the homes. And in, in essence, people are being forced to come before the board to ask for something that everybody wants to happen anyway. So the thought is to have a little bit of flexibility where there may be a house that's built at the front setback line, the homeowner wants to add a modest open air front porch uh, to, to provide a little bit more flexibility within the ordinance to allow that rather than have to come before the zoning board for the variance. S similarly, um, there's been some question about front yard setback requirements themselves for the buildings. Some neighborhoods in town have a pattern of development where the houses are closer or further back than um, what the typical setback line in the zone may require. And rather than have a new home be set further back that would be out of character with its neighbors, the idea would be to match the existing pattern and to give that flexibility in the ordinance rather than have an applicant or a homeowner have to come before the board and say, look, we just want to line ourselves up with our neighbors rather than be 10, 15, 20 feet further back, as the case may be. So that's one of the other issues. Um, a more technical kind of basic thing, right now the ordinance 
has a uh, duration for variance approvals of one year, especially over the last couple of years with the pandemic, with uh, supply chain issues, uncertainty about pricing and contractors. There's been a lot of delays of projects. The board thought that rather than have people come back and have to ask for an extension of an approval that the board essentially just gave them, years really not that long, um, to extend that period to, to two years to avoid having to constantly have people coming back and asking for extensions of time for those projects that have already been approved. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, there's some questions that have arisen about definitions related to basement spaces and attic spaces. Um, that can get a little sticky, especially when you have lots that have slopes where you may have a walkout basement and, and start to deal with questions of how many stories a building is. Um, this is probably the most complicated of the issues and just started looking at it a little bit, but um, that's something that may require a little more workshopping than the others that are fairly straightforward in my opinion. But that's something that um, I would look forward to coming back and discussing again with, with the planning board and the council. Um, two other issues were raised um, by the board recently as well that weren't part of the report, but I just want to bring them to the council's attention. Related to these issues of projects showing up before the board, being on an agenda and taking some time to, to be heard and then having to leave, come back again, um, the zoning board has requested that be, some modifications be made to the village's fee schedule to allow for a little more escrow money to be placed at the time of application to provide for a completeness review by the board's professionals and a technical review to make sure that the project that comes before the board has checked all the boxes that it needs to from a technical standpoint so that the board has what it needs to make a decision because there's been a pattern of projects showing up with loose ends that then have to leave and come back again. So to avoid that process, um, there's been a request to, to adjust the fee schedule and to provide for um, a more thorough upfront review. And then lastly, um, there's been some concern about changes happening over time. Records, records obviously have been lost over the years due to natural disasters and the like. But um, there's been a request to consider requiring as-built surveys at the conclusion of projects. Right now, the village ordinance requires that for pro properties that are in the floodplain, you have to verify that the elevation of the building is um, is built properly, but it doesn't necessarily require that for all projects. So the idea would be that at the conclusion of your development, there's a record of exactly what was built, exactly what was approved, and then that becomes part of the, the file going forward essentially. So if the property is subject of another application down the line, everybody has that clear starting point from the last time it was approved. Uh, so that would require a relatively simple modification to the standards in the ordinance to require the submission of that as-built survey at the conclusion of the project. So those are the, those are the issues that, that are before us, I think, at the moment. And take any questions, or if, Pam, if you had anything to, to add as well. So you're saying that the as-built plans would, would be an added requirement? It, it, it would be, and that would be something that prior, likely it would be tied into the certificate of occupancy, which is typically the conclusion, the big bow at the end of the project. Um, so then prior to issuing the certificate of occupancy, an applicant would have to come in with the as-built survey and demonstrate that everything was done as it was supposed to be, and then that would become part of the village's file. And did you, did you mention circular driveways also? I, I did, and, and that's some part of the, um, there's concern about circular driveways, about um, how those are measured in terms of the width. Is it two pieces? At what point does it become one piece? And then also, um, they tend not to be as, as desirable for smaller lots because they occupy a great deal of the front yard. Uh, corner lots are a different story, where you may have access to two streets. Uh, I think that um, the desire was to move away from circular driveways, but the ordinance right now is not clear doesn't explicitly pr prohibit them or permit them. I think clarity is really what the board would like. 
Okay. The reason I ask is because in some situations they can provide safety. S no. Since you're not, you know, you're not <coughs> backing out of your driveway, you're going front first. They they can, but then it, when you get, when you end up with a lot of circular driveways in a row, you can get into a jumble. It's got its merits both ways, and not, not necessarily saying that we've arrived on a, at a conclusion to permit or prohibit. I think the board just would really like clarity about whether they are or are not. And the board's asking for the village to authorize <coughs> the planning board to look at this and have you um, explore all these points, right? Right, and the, the process would be to prepare a, probably prepare a draft ordinance, the amendments that, that would be recommended, have those reviewed uh, by the council, have those reviewed by the planning board, and then the, the council could go through the process of, of enacting the changes. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. just I, oh, go ahead. No, I, I just want to say I love the idea of the streetscape because I imagine that is a huge consideration. And if you're sticking, I just I loved it. I think it's great, and I fully think it's an awesome write up to have explored by other experts. So thank you. You're welcome. Just with that, Mayor, I would have a couple of recommendations. First of all, <clears throat> the extension from a one-year period for a two-year period uh, for compliance is a good idea. I think a number of towns have gone with that, and it's something we should do. We did it effectively through uh, COVID for the purposes of the delays that might be caused by delivery of goods or delivery of, of work, but uh, I think it's something we should see going forward. With regard to the uh, front porch issues, not only is it an aesthetic issue, but it's also a, a very much, a, and I, I think even more important, a safety issue. By providing a covered area for people coming to the house, delivery and things like that, that creates a, a much safer transition for anybody coming in and out of the, out of the residence. For, you know, and, and I think from that standpoint, that should be something that, the, uh, that the, the planning board should look at and try and see if there's a way of rectifying it. Um, the front yard setback, I know that you can take some issues with regard to um, if there is, a, as you suggest, if there is a neighborhood where you do have an existing group of homes or a row of homes that are intruding into the set yard setback already and they want to do something, you can make adjustments based on that and recognize that in the ordinance. And if that is something that looks like a useful planning tool for the zoning board or to keep people from having to come to the zoning board, to do a minor addition or a minor aspect of their home, that sounds like it would be a benefit as well. The one question I have is with regard to the as-built surveys. Um, are you suggesting that with every development? Because if you have a homeowner that comes in and puts on a, on a uh, puts a, say a playroom on the back of a house or something like that, that can be a relatively, I won't say minor expense, but certainly relatively minor adjustment to the survey or the or the perimeter of what the building is. Are you, gonna, are you suggesting to use it on all, on all applications or just on some? And, and which ones, if it's some, or if it's all, that's something for the council to consider. If it's some, try and delineate those smaller applications in the zoning board that the zoning board sees a lot, which is a homeowner trying to improve the, the size or you know, relative area of the house without having to go through a, a full CO and, and an occupant, occupancy issue that might warrant something like that. So that would be the recommendations that I would have. Yeah, I think that that's still somewhat of an open question. This is a, um, a relatively recent topic that's come up. And as I said, I think the origin of it is that the board has been presented with things that where the, the older records and the current situation on the ground do not agree. And there's some concern or question about how we got from point A to point B. And this is seen as a tool to try to prevent that from happening in the future. Point well made about there may be a line where when you're on one side of the line, you don't need to worry about the as-built survey. Um, I'm not sure exactly what scale of project warrants yet. Um, you know, it could be particular types of variances, may pervious coverage and so forth. I think that there's, uh, I think there's a certain amount of that, obviously.
I think uh, absolutely. Th thank you for the the input, and I think it's an important consideration that we have to weigh. It, that all these things have have certain trade offs, but we'll we'll talk about talk about it with the board and come back with uh, some recommendations. Does anyone else have any other comments? I just have one question: What does the planning board need from us in order for them to allow you to explore these? Um, matters I don't believe there's anything formal I think it's really just to go ahead from the council that there's interest in, in pursuing them because ultimately the council needs to act on any ordinance changes right. uh, we can effectively use the the planning board as a workshop but it's still going to be the council's Correct. to adopt yeah. so, so do you just need an email from mr. Rogers to the attorney for the planning board saying he's authorized to proceed that you're authorized to proceed or from me to? Okay. Great. Works for me. Great. Okay. John, thank you so much. Pam, thank you so much. And to the chairman of the zoning board, uh, Greg Brown, I want to thank you all for making this easier for our residents so that it saves them time, saves them money, and it, it's more work for you, and we appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me and uh, for being willing to move forward with some of these changes. Great. Have a nice evening. Benefit. Thanks. Okay. So now we'll go back to our regular agenda, number 8A, um, report from Ad Hoc Communications Committee. If you want, no. <laughs> if you guys like, you can sit at the table. No, I'm so sorry. I find more energy that if way. you're happy, we're happy. I just wanted to introduce myself um, to begin with. Excuse me, Ashley, would you mic? speak into the microphone? Do you, do you have, have a handheld, uh, no, Dylan, right. that I'll she sit. could use? And I'll there you go. Stand. I'll stand and speak. I like to move around because I think it's more engaging, but I'll, I'll stand for. <laughs> we can give you a handheld, and this and way you can you walk around. around. I'm you, good. I'm good. Okay. Thank you, though. Um, Ashley Chauvin, I'm speaking on behalf of the Communications Committee today with Tim. You have to speak. You have to yeah, speak into really the mic. <laughs> you really right. should use the handheld. You should hand really use yeah, the handheld. It's, it's better. better. It'll right. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> How's this? Yeah, there we go. That's much better. Okay. And if you could hold that closer to your mouth. How's so. this? Thank you so much. All right. Sorry about all the, the, the tech issues tonight. I'm Ashley Chauvin. I'm speaking on behalf of the Communications Committee today. It is an ad hoc committee uh, with many citizens involved. You can see them all here, all of these names. I think there's about 15 or 16 of them. Um, I've lived in Ridgewood for about 10 years. Um, I'm on the Park and Rec Board, so volunteer there. I got roped into the Communications Committee because uh, of my interests, and I'd also say my day job. Uh, for my day job, I work in marketing at Mars Wrigley, and one of our brands is M&M's, and I thought I'd actually bring some, some snacks. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about a lot of tough topics tonight, and I don't think this is going to be a, a difficult one. Um, so I'm going to first hand them out to the um, council, and then um, hopefully there's 55. I so need the please. microphone up higher, please. <laughs> <laughs> or just shout. <laughs> I, I usually have a pretty loud voice. But anyway, I'm going to hand them out. There's 55. Hopefully they go around the whole room. But if not, come find me later. <laughs> hopefully it does. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started. We're here for the same reason that the council members are here and why everyone here at nine o'clock on a Wednesday. Uh, we care about the town. We, we love this town, we love Ridgewood. Um, and we wanna be part of a town that's successful, that's engaged, and that community members are really leaning in. Obviously everyone in this room is leaning in. Uh, but one of the things that's important um, to have all those things that I just spoke about is transparent, accessible, and clear communication. Without that, people can't be informed, people can't be engaged. And so that's why we're here to talk about communications specifically. You lost the audience to Candy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still trying to get off this slide. Hold on. All right. <laughs> so you know why we're here. You know what's important that we're here to talk about, why it's important to all of us. The next point that I want to make is the fact that how we communicate and how we find information has changed drastically. COVID-19 really accelerated that with bringing people online. There's so many more people online looking for information. They're finding it through their friends. They're on Facebook. That's exactly what these charts up here are showing you. In fact, actually, TikTok. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, but TikTok is a place that people are going to for news. It's a bit alarming. We want to make sure that where they're going to, they can find truthful and accurate information about the town. And so that's another reason why this communications council came together. Bear with me as we go to the next slide. All right, with all these people moving online and this need for instant gratification, people's expectations are high online. Um, they're looking for personalized information. That's exactly what I'm doing day to day in, in my job. We're looking for ways to meet people where they're at, if they're you know, an, an older person looking for X, Y, and Z, or if they're a younger person looking for whatever pair of shoes that they want. People want things personalized and they expect it and companies and organizations are giving it to them that way. Um, they're looking for fast download time. They don't want to go to a site and then wait for it to load and load. They just won't stay there. They'll leave, they'll go somewhere else. In this case, like I said with my job, they're going to go somewhere else and buy something else. With us as a town, they're going to go somewhere else and find information elsewhere, which might not be as accurate. They're looking for something that's easy to use and intuitive, right? The iPhone, I think, is a really great example of that. We didn't know we needed one. and. <laughs> I think probably everyone in the room not, not necessarily has an iPhone, but certainly has a phone that is so easy to use that you never would have even thought that you'd have this in your phone day to day with you all the time, um, like we do now. And then the other part um, that digital has really opened our eyes to is this aesthetic. Um, people want something that's beautiful and engaging, and they get it through things like Instagram or in other places online. It's really changed how we've engage with each other, how we engage with content, and how we engage with information. And so how as a community are we building our communications to be more digitally first? Today's conversation isn't about our website, but we did take a look at our website and, and evaluate it um, against some of the other websites. Our website isn't the only way in which people find information. People are also going to social media, like we were talking about in other places, but digital is a primary place where people are are finding their information, and so that's why we're picking on the website today. <laughs> it's not that, um, you know, I think the one thing here that's really important to note, it's um, this is a qualitative assessment. It, 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 would, it would need a little bit more robustment, and that's what you'll see in some of the recommendations that we're actually gonna be making. These are the different parts that we evaluated the website on, things like download time, number of lists versus, um, there's, well, I'll show you in a moment. Actually, I can't click through. I thought I was gonna have a computer here tonight. <laughs> Do you have one over there? No, it's all right, don't worry about it. Um, but these are the different types of criteria that we looked, um, the amount of lists that were on the websites, um, if there was an ability to log in so you could have a personalized account and find information that was most relevant to you. Some of the other towns' websites do allow for that. And then is the menu intuitive? So you know when you go on the top and there's all these tabs, is that menu intuitive for people? So those are all the ways that we evaluated um, both Franklin Lakes and Bridgewood as well as the Montclair website relative, you know, compared to our own. 
the friendliness and welcoming um, the domain name, name, just even using .org or .net. I don't know how many people are familiar with .net, but certainly .org is much more familiar with, with many people because people are familiar with organizations versus networks. Um, there's the, a description underneath, for example, of the town websites around what that website's about. Um, things like, welcome, come discover, Franklin Lakes versus um, some of the examples that we saw with, with our website. And then the ability to sync with social. So some of the websites, for example, even had the social handles or the social graphics on their website. So you could go from the digital website right directly to um, the social media accounts, which is kind of a cool feature as well. And then the appeal attractiveness, how we looked at that and evaluated it was based on things like um, the imagery used of the town, for example, or including people in those images themselves. I've covered a lot. I'm just going to pause for a moment and just make sure that everyone's tracking between, <laughs> between the candy and if there's any questions <laughs> um, from the town council since I wasn't able to uh, and didn't bring up an actual demo. All good over here. Okay, good. Um, great. One of the things that we wanted to make sure came through and we were able to land today is that um, when we have antiquated systems, it can have a really negative impact. Um, it could be frustrating for people. So I was talking about earlier the wait time that people um, experience. They will leave your website or they will leave the experience. It's frustrating. Sometimes, I mean, we heard a lot of frustration today and some of that, <laughs> frankly, I think some of that's coming down to communication, not just our website, but communication in general. Um, it can also lead to a lack of information or misinformation. Um, we've seen it uh, with the, and I hate to say it, with the 2016 elections, for example, where people heard information, they repeated it, it was misinformation. That help happens in a, in a smaller chasm, actually, within our town in, in, another, in other places as well. And then it can also raise, um, I think this is a really important point, transparency concerns. People are like, well, what's happening? Who's doing what? <laughs> what's happening with Schleidler? How are the neighbors um, reacting to that? Um, just using an example in town. All right. We talked about all the changes that have happened with digital, why it's important, some of the specific examples with our own website in terms of why we formed this committee and why we think digital in particular needs to be something that we focus on as a committee and as a, as a town. Um, it's really important that we look for ways to meet our citizens first. Um, we're not necessarily representative of everyone who's in this town here today in our building, uh, and today in this, in this meeting, in fact. Um, and we need to make sure that our experiences online or otherwise in terms of how we're commuting, communicating, excuse me, meets everyone's needs. Um, and that's important, um, an important point to note here. There we go. Okay, so what are we proposing um, as a concerned subcommittee of, of citizens? Um, that we need to look for ways to be able to holistically, we need to look for ways to um, audit our communications systems. Um, so that doesn't just include our website, for example, but more broadly, um, how we communicate as, as a council and, and as a town. What we're asking for is to actually prioritize um, our website and our social media sites, and specifically the Facebook, in fact. And then, wow, that, that one moved quickly, <laughs> unlike, the, unlike all the other clicks that I had. Um, what we're really asking today from council is alignment to prioritize the website specifically for communications because it is a main way in which people receive information, an important um, place where people find information. Um, thanks, Paul. <laughs> and then we're also looking to authorize a formal um, RFP or interview process so we can bring somebody on to help actually evaluate, like I was saying, and, and do an audit, for example, and or create or develop content. Um, I spoke a lot today about the website, actually, and, and ease of use, but what I didn't speak about as much is around the content development and the requirements around that, which is actually pretty robust. It's not a matter of just creating content for that um, one point in time, but it's a continuous um, content development need 
um, and it is quite robust. And it's not something that, um, you know, it, it, it's not something that it's a one and done. It's something that's going to really require ongoing. Um, so that is what we're looking for tonight in terms of um, an ask from the, the village council. Tim, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Because I know I, I... No, I think you've done great, There's, uh, especially with the M&Ms. Uh, I, I just came here to sort of got involved at the, after the train had left the station, and I'm glad. Uh, I'm excited about what's taken place thus far. But I, I think, as Ashley indicated, this is just the start. And the other, the other point, I mean, I come... I've been involved in digital transformation now for 30 years, or even going back. I, I was in newspapers and have been moving. I was a, uh, a newspaper reporter and editor, and then uh, was engaged in you know, building some of the first news websites in, in the West Coast. In the West Coast, and then, uh, sadly, we've closed so many print editions, but. The digital transformation project in news is pretty much uh, closer to the, you know, it's way, way more evolved. Corporate America also is in, engaged um, in that digital transformation. I would say that some might ask, well, what's the need? Why do we need to do this? And I would say that uh, there's a, a tremendous number of studies that a better website will result in a happier or more uh, a community that is, has more pride in the community. Uh, it will be good uh, because one of the things I think we all agree is there are a lot of great stories here to tell. And I think this effort can help uh, us reach more of those individuals who do this. And the, and the, the other um, thing t is that if we don't move on this now, uh, start it, I, I mean, even it's going to take several years to do it, probably. I, I, I used to say, I built a lot of websites, but I never finished one. And that's because they never are finished. So even if we are very happy with what we have today, it's important to, to keep an eye uh, on the road ahead. And, you know, uh, some of these uh, apps that we're, are very popular now with uh, my kids, uh, we might not even be using. I'll figure, I figured out how to use Snapchat, and, now, and then nobody uses it anymore, or at least uh, it's moved, they've moved on to other things. My point is that this is important to, uh, to begin this journey. And I think Ashley alluded to this too, the content development strategy, there needs to be, that's not s something that is, uh, resides within the technology side of the house. Uh, one of the things in meeting uh, with Dylan and other, uh, others a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, they pointed out Montclair site as being a model, and then I went to look. Oh wow! Well, they have a, a site where they have technology and editorial or com, a comms director. The comms director's been doing it now for about 18 years, and before that, she ran the web programs or communications at St. Peter's College, and then before that in communication. Anyway, I just think that... I think Tim's made some really good points, which is, just to quickly yeah, summarize, no, one being that tr digital transformation isn't something that's unique to needs here in Ridgewood. It's something that's happening across um, all corporate environments. Um, yeah. It's happening in Mars Wrigley. The second point being that um, content development is actually a separate skill set than developing a website. And I think that's something that we need to recognize and. and be clear about, but it's it's beyond a website. It's about communications yeah. in general and how do we communicate to people to meet their needs where they're at. Um, and so, I think it's a really really important point to land. And I don't think I actually spent enough time on it when I when I spoke tonight. 
um, we have whole departments of people who are dedicated to just developing social ca um, content, for example, or just developing advertising. Clearly, we're not doing that here today. <laughs> but my point being is that it does require um, a unique skill set to be able to develop content um, made uniquely for different platforms that help us communicate in different ways to people. Um, so I think those are two really yeah. important points to land. But knowing that we're here, it's late, and I was trying to, really trying to get through that with a little bit of fun with those M&Ms. I want to make sure we can answer any questions because um, there was a lot that we covered and also um, the ask that we have here tonight. Questions? Siobhan, you want to make some comments on your committee? I have some questions. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. But I did. <laughs> so sorry. Um, so the estimated cost of 30000 are we hiring a outside person to do this, or is this within the communications committee? That uh, the intent would be that we'd be looking to hire somebody out. That would be what the RFP process would be for. Okay. Um, and that would be an estimated cost based on some of what we've seen in talking to um, different. I don't know if you call them companies, but. Okay. Different, different uh, ways in which we've sourced uh, this for this approximation. Okay. There are I mean, few, oh, sorry, there were quite a few consultancies that uh, specifically work with towns of our size and, and smaller and larger, and they are uh, they work at scale, be, and which means the uh, initial cost to us much more affordable than one might think. Okay. I mean, I'm asking because. We've been talking about updating the website for years and years and years, and the estimates that have been thrown around in the past are like 5,000, 10,000, so this pretty much shocked me. We're, we're in budget season right now. There's a lot we could do with $30,000, like, uh, and, uh, and then in additional to be determined, what are you, are you estimating? Any idea how much the to be determined costs would be? That would be for content development, and so that's why it's to be determined depending on scope. So I, I don't know if it even I don't even know if it would fit within this budget cycle, frankly. Um, but we didn't want to leave it off the table, knowing that it could become a need. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Anything else no, you'd like, like to the add? one thing to add to to to, the, to that answer is that part of you know, we, we aren't, I don't, I'm sorry. Speak in the microphone, please. What? That would be a request for proposal. That's what you issue. Uh, it's, we would be, that would be advertised and shared out in the community of uh, consultant fir firms and others, and they would uh, submit a proposal. We've already... Um, seeing kind of a draft s sample proposal. They're very common. And I was, su I was surprised at how affordable it would be. So uh, it's when you with, procure yeah. a service, essentially. And so we, there's a process that's associated with seeing different proposals to ensure that we're comfortable with the cost <laughs> and the value of what we would but, receive. This is an estimate of, or an ask for an estimate um, based on some initial proposals that were seen, but not through a formal process. Um, and so that's what the, the request here is to say, hey, can we begin a formal process? So we would yeah. advertise um, or make it available to the public or anyone who wanted to um, participate in that proposal um, process as a business. And, and, and that would... No, we have not spoken yeah. to the other two towns. So there's some differences, and Tim was talking about that. Um, one of the towns, for example, has a head count, so they have somebody dedicated fully to um, not necessarily a website development, to be clear. <laughs> it's a communications role. And so they do things like public relations, so maybe like speaking with newspapers, maybe managing some of the other different types of communications that would go out and include it on their website. So it's just a different structure in terms of uh, how they manage uh, the resources internally as well as externally. But um, no, we haven't done a full, and that's one of the other proposals here, uh, 
on the other slide, which is like a full audit of what we might be able to do to optimize and improve um, how we currently communicate, including maybe even uh, things like how other towns are structured, for example. Are there any other questions from the council? Oh, sorry about that. That's yes. quite all right. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make a couple comments real sure. quick. Sure. So um, first I want to thank the communications team and I want to thank Dylan and Heather um, who when we when I came on board there were some very you know this committee's been meeting throughout the fall um, obviously the election forced um, a lot of discussion in town and repeat topic of a conversation no matter what issue is how do I find that where can I research it where can I get information um, another constant topic was within the business community is I'm a new business I'm a new resident how do I apply how do I do this and we talked largely in the fall about the focus on new how to engage new people in our community so when we met with Dylan and Heather there were some quick easy things that could be done and I really want to thank them and I want to thank the team because you know we started an Instagram account and while that sounds very basic Instagram is where a whole different audience and different demographic is and what became apparent is you know there's many ways to solve this you know we can discuss the website but I think the most compelling thing is that there's a new way of doing business okay there's the old and everyone here has done a good job of doing the business we've been in but the communication overlay is an opportunity for us it's an opportunity for our main street and our citizens to get information and move us forward and there's many different ways to do it so there's the website and content creation what that means I'm going to say this to Patty um, the content creation would be who creates the flyer people have an incredible appetite for content right now and we're pumping it out what we can but not enough because you put one bit of information out and the consumer which is the citizen wants more so we were looking at not only the website but content creation and those are two things I do have several examples of costs and benefits and because it's budget season Dylan and Heather have been very intimate in the discussion we had a pre-meeting um, might not be the year to do it all but it's definitely the year to get started and I just I think the beauty of this is there's a general agreement that this is a new way of doing business and there's a public demand for it so that's all I wanted to say and I love the candies I think we probably should have started by thanking Heather and Dylan first sorry about that guys you have been it, it was really wonderful meeting with you and understanding all the work that you've already done um, and, it, and I know that not only the Instagram but apparently scheduling calendar had gone out as well which was like very important um, to continue to communicate about information this would just be one other way that we can continue to improve that communication stream so are there any other questions up here I suppose before we I think I think you've answered all of the council's questions um, I just want to say as Siobhan did I want to thank this committee um, these are all uh, great residents who are contributing their time and their considerable expertise Ashley and Tim we really appreciate it um, I, I have to thank Siobhan for bringing this issue to the forefront um, uh, you know I, I have I have noted for many years now that the, that the village does so many great things and we are so bad at getting the word out um, a a prime example is our our is the stigma free committee and those great programs that I mentioned they run these programs and sometimes three people show up because they don't get the word out and we don't get the word out and this is something I think you know, this is something we must invest in it is it is and if we and if we don't invest in it then that word that's bandied about all day long transparency well this is a uh, a deliberate lack of transparency simply by not telling people in the way that they need to hear it so um, I, I, I know that I'm going to I'm going to look at the at the uh, uh, request in terms of how much you need and where it's going to go and I know it's something that that I'm it's very important to me Tim your words um, will stay with me for a long time I built a lot of websites but I've never finished one which only goes to show why I think it's time that I got rid of my 8-track tape player. <laughs> so um, thank you all very, very much. I just want to thank you as well, um, Council Member Winograd, as well as this committee. Um, we are discussing the budget the next two nights coming up. 
and this will be part of that discussion and seeing where we can fit it in within our budget this year. I was on. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, unless there's any other questions, we'll go ahead and distribute the rest of the candy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Our next um, subject is the Shedler property update. And I'll have Mr. Ruddesauser come up. Oh, I'm a fun guy. Thanks, Linda. Thank you very much. All the advantages of being on council. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, once again, we're here to discuss what to do with Shedler. Um, I just handed out some of our latest efforts by Yovan Mahenzik, the assistant engineer. Uh, the drawing up on screen, and it should be the first drawing that I, in the two I just gave you, uh, this concept plan 1C. This shows a full-size soccer lacrosse field with runout on the property and how we could fit in a parking lot up against the berm, a restroom with the uh, weather shelter, and a playground. Uh, just to the north or right as you're looking at the drawing, you can see uh, a shaded area that would be undisturbed woodland. Okay, uh, happy to answer any questions, uh, it, or we can go to the other drawing. Uh, first, what's, I'm just curious, what's the difference between the two drawings other than the trees, uh, the, the existing trees? Uh, there's a couple of mi very minor differences. Actually, the drawing that's up there, mm -hmm. if you look carefully at the rear of the house, you'll see the parking lot as we had originally configured it. The next drawing should show it flipped 180 degrees. I believe there had been a request from you, Mayor, as to how that would look. Uh, it doesn't really, there isn't really much of a change. Um, we just stripe the other side of the block that is the parking area. Got it. Okay. Uh, we did not want to move, looking at the drawing, too much to the left. Uh, we have the two shag bark hickory trees that are shown there bracketing the, the paver patio. We want to make sure they survive. Good. 
questions? Chris, I have um, just my first question. I'm, I'm curious how, if I recall, was the original entrance at Kingsbridge and then it got moved to Terhune and then it got moved back to Kingsbridge? Um, if there was an entrance at Kingsbridge, it would pretty much negate a lot of the square footage that could be used for recreational fields. No, I think you mean if there was an entrance at Terhune. Uh, let me see. I don't have the streets labeled. The, the if we had an entrance to the north of the house, that would that would compromise a lot of the field Ex playing area. Exactly. So that's my question. Do you know why it got moved? Was it ship? Was it a conversation with Shippo? Do you remember? It? Or or you just moved it because you said I can't get a field here if the entrance is here? Uh, we moved it. Uh, not, not in any particular discussion with Shippo. Uh, Shippo does not want an entrance driveway too close to the house. Mm -hmm. So the offset is about equal either side, but principally because it would compromise any kind of playing field. Right. You couldn't have a playing field if you had the entrance at Terhune, um, at least for my opinion. Um, now, I walked the property today with Yovan. Mm -hmm. and he had the big field staked out and the little field. And it's, I mean, you can see it on the plan how close the field is to the house. It's frightening how close it is. There's no room behind the field. There's just, it's going to be the end of the field, bushes, the house. Yeah, as we show on the drawing, the runout area, the dash line, does go up to the posed tree hedge that acts as a screen between the recreational field and the house. Right. But it's, I mean, it's, very, it's, you know, my opinion is this is trying to, you know, squeeze a size two bathing suit onto a size 12 person, as Kelly Joya said when we were talking about Valley Hospital. I will never forget that. And this is exactly the same thing. Um, you know, both on either ends. On the far end of the field, the, the buffer is right up on the property line. Even on the street, you know, we walked it. We walked where the cutout would be for the cars, and then we figured eight feet for the trees, and the field was then right there. It, it's... My opinion, it doesn't fit. You're, we're trying to squeeze something in that does not belong. You just look at it and you can see there's no balance. It doesn't fit. It doesn't belong. I mean, it, it's going, you really have to put the road into the berm, correct? Um, we are moving it, as we show on the drawing, we're moving it into the toe of the berm. The toe of the berm. And then the walking path will be into the berm? Or uh, just shifted in over front also. of it? What? It will be shifted over just at that area where we show it in red, the roadway to the parking area. We don't want the roadway right to, you know, we, don't, we wanted to show the roadway and the run out area to the field. We'll mm -hmm. probably shift this over in final design because around that corner, we'll probably put in a barrier similar to what we installed when we constructed the playground here at Village Hall. Mm -hmm. And on the small field, which we don't even have, I don't have that thing anymore. I should have brought it, but there were going to be, you know, trees in front of the parking lot, canopy trees. There, there's no room for those either. There is nothing to protect the people on West Saddle River Road. It is just completely open, the whole property. On the left of the entrance, are, there, are you leaving that untouched? Uh, at this time, there is no intention right now for anything to go there. Uh, some of the things that have been considered is possibly a community garden. I've mentioned that in the past. Um, 
when I meet with SHPO, I will raise that subject with them and see what their feelings are for it. Okay. Because on, on the new design, so there's basically a cluster of trees to the left of the entrance, and there'll be a cluster of trees in the far right back corner. It, and I, I'll go back to the residents. You know, I was in the audience. I went to these meetings. It was promised this this property was not going to be clear cut, and here we are. It's going to be clear cut. It's unfair. It's not right. It's. I just can't say it enough. You're trying to squeeze something in that does not fit. That's my comments. And I really. I mean, the main thing for me is the residents and the safety of the kids. I truly believe we need to have an independent medical evaluation because I'm Googling things, you know, I'm reading, I'm hearing what Salvo says. It's scary. I don't think I'd let my kids play on this after reading what I read today. Uh, why risk it? It's, it seems like we're making a mistake. And it's going to be, we're going to, we're rushing into this, and then in three years, all these things are going to come out, kids are going to get sick, and we'll be like, oops, we made a mistake. We can't do this. We can't. I know we need fields, but this is not the way to do it. That's what I have to say. Anything else to read? For now, that's it. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, where would the bleachers go? If this were an artificial turf field, you can't put chairs on it. You can't put the bleachers on the field. So where would the bleachers go? Um, first to the turf question. Um, that's still a question I'm going to discuss with SHPO. My initial inquiries with SHPO on turf is they don't like it, and they generally send the project that proposes it to the Historic Sites Council. So again, that's a decision I look for you folks in the council to say whether you want turf or not, um, and then we'll proceed accordingly. As okay. to bleachers, we're not proposing any bleachers. The bleachers that we would anticipate being there or be the smaller portable ones that can easily be moved around. No permanent bleacher. We, don't, we haven't shown them. As I said, Jovan just finished these drawings. What you have this afternoon, they are very conceptual. They're not fully landscaped. They're certainly not graded. Um, a lot of the minor details, has, we have many more weeks to work on. If we were to go with this plan, we, would we be moving the um, post and rail fence back uh, to make room for that uh, south, southwest corner? Uh, the post and rail fence only up at the toe of the berm. Right. And that, not the post and rail fence that is part of the buffer with West Saddle River Road. Right. And would you also be having to take out some of those arbavita that were just planted? Uh, we will probably replant some. Um, we're currently looking at those arborvitaes that were planted, and eh, they don't seem to like it there. We may have to get the contractor to replace them. They always t turn brown in the winter, but they are looking unhappy. <laughs> That's a, a nice way to put it, yes, unhappy. Mm -hmm. Um, I will be posting on my uh, web page on the Village website the article that Patty and Fantino mentioned from uh, Mount Sinai Medical School, that being one of the premier medical schools and research facilities in the country. It's uh, a letter of, of advice to the town of Maplewood when it was considering putting in a turf field. Um, I also would like to point out that the the city of Boston has banned turf installation, and the Boston mayor's office put out a statement that the city has a preference for grass playing surfaces wherever possible and will not be installing playing surfaces with PFAS chemicals moving forward. The problem used to be crumb rubber, and the manufacturers heard complaints about it, 
and a lot of them are moving to cork and um, coconut infill, infill, like what's at uh, the new Glen Rock uh, turfed field. If you go there, it is beautiful. And it's not just for organized sports. It's not just team sports. People come there and they casually hang out, throw a ball. You see kids playing lacrosse, and, and it's really quite lovely. Um, they have very high netting to protect the houses across the street. And where would, would netting here go? Uh, that is something first I have to discuss with the State Historic Preservation Commission. Um, I asked them the question. They haven't responded as to what their thoughts are on like a lacrosse safety netting, uh, both netting and how high it could be placed. I'd like to get clarification from them. Again, that gives us guidance as to how to go forward design-wise and what the final product to present to the council and then to ship home. Um, as I mentioned, the issue now is PFAS because the, um, the grass part of it is a polymer, a chemical mixture that has as an additive PFAS and, so that it will go through the extrusion machine without getting clogged. And um, PFAS is kind of hard to test for because it can be a gas, it can be a solid, it can be a liquid. And um, as, as turf ages, dust comes, the infill degrades, and things become airborne. And you think, well, I thought PFAS was just a problem in the water. No, it can be airborne, it can be inhaled. And children, being closer to the ground, are closer to where that dust is. I want to bring these things to your attention. Um, there is very little research on the effects of PFAS from these alternative infills. And with that lack of evidence, um, that's why Mount Sinai asks for a moratorium. And um, kids also breathe differently than adults. They have a faster respiration rate, and they can't sweat like adults do. They don't sweat as much as we do, and so they can't regulate the temperature of their bodies. You know that on turf, on artificial turf, the temperatures are much hotter than on grass. And um, the extreme heat can cause dehydration, heat stroke, um, and burns. I mean, imagine a kid running, falling, slipping, and tearing over their skin. There are no studies of dermal, um, um, not ingestion, but is that a pathway into the body? Abrasions. OK, thank you. Um, note, PFAS accumulates over time. So the younger you are, the more opportunity you have to bring it in. We've all been drinking PFAS since the 1940s. Has it affected us? Maybe. There are no studies that um, conclusively show that PFAS causes things, but there are lab, uh, they've done tests with lab animals that show um, a link, not necessarily causation, but a link to things like thyroid problems, male infertility, hormone disruption, uh, and oh, cardiovascular problems. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. This is why we're spending $100 million to clean our water. Um, water is the, the most noticeable way to ingest PFAS, but other things are really important also, like carpeting, like your furniture, the fabric being treated with stain resistance. That's all PFAS. And, you know, if you have a toddler who's, who's crawling around on the ground, on, on these carpets, on, on turf, 
it's cumulative. Um, I'm, I'm worried about it. Uh, and until, these uh, until such studies are done, um, we just don't know. You could, say, you could say, oh, well, it's ubiquitous. PFAS is everywhere. But there are some things you can do. And um, I think it was the National Institute of Health, Health Sciences, was saying, look at the ingredients. If you're buying cosmetics, what's in them? Like waterproof mascara? Um, if you're looking at your clothing, what's in them? Gore-Tex just announced that they are no longer going to have certain levels of known PFAS or, or environmental um, additives in their clothing. So their raincoats are not going to be using PFAS in the future. That's great. People are recognizing these dangers. And um, there are things you can do. You can, you can uh, choose not to eat pizza that's been in a pizza box. Food wrappings, like your burgers, they are all treated with PFAS. This is coming in our food. It also goes up the food chain. So we put turf on our, on our land and it rains. That stuff seeps into the soil, into the water system, gets into your fish. We eat the fish and it gets more and more concentrated. These are things I just think you all need to think about. Anything Sold else, me, Pam. <laughs> Good job. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I have a couple things. So um, I want to add some facts and then kind of break down a way through this. So Chris, my first question on this plan was I thought we were flipping the, I, I thought we were flipping the parking lot closer to the house to go the other way. Didn't we talk about that? I just mentioned that. He did. He did. Can, I mentioned uh, it. One yeah. drawing shows it flip. One drawing shows oh, it flip. Got it, got it, got it. Sorry. Um, it's hard to tell because the, the rectangle that is the parking lot is just the same. We basically got it, got it. striping. Sorry. Okay, so that was my only question. I wanted to start in order to get back to the Shedler conversation because, um, you know, we do, as a village, already have turf fields. Um, and I think we have a commitment there that prior to my getting here, and I'm very aware there's been three other studies that were sent to the council, one from Westfield, who just put in a turf proposal. There was a heat study conducted by Ridgewood regarding the effects of heat on athletes. Clearly nobody, I don't know what sport anyone's kids or you guys play, but heat is a constant concern, especially with global warming. And you can get things like turf burn, which you have a reflection. You can also get a burn, which is an abrasion. And Ridgewood ran its own heat study in 2009. I'm unsure if we were so concerned why we haven't run another one, but we all have that. That being said, I feel like this conversation of rubrics might be applied best. So the council can either take this, leave it, but I want to speak to my own thing. First of all, I want to thank the engineering department for endless renditions. I, um, you know, being new, I, I've said this before in a workshop, this is my only access to staff professionals. And I want to thank Yovan and Peter who took us on the property and spent hours with Lorraine and I, and Lorraine obviously went back without me, but I am incredibly grateful to our very, very awesome staff that I think we should all feel very good about. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was that the, a change with the property that happened, and we all discussed this, is that when the prior council made the decision to implement the berm, the ratio of the berm, a berm's a structure, it, it's one to three. So the actual berm ate up a full acre of land. So when you're looking at these plans, there's a couple things that I've learned mathematically, and I've gone through them extensively. The berm ate up of the 7.11 acres just shy, like literally like one-tenth shy of a full acre. So when we were planning it, that was surprising. That being said, in 2009, the whole town felt this was a good purchase. You know, I talked to the people on the original committee, letters have been written, and you know, at that point in time, I was a first-time homeowner. Um, our house, because of subprime, was underwater. The world was hemorrhaging, and this was a big purchase for our town. And I think everybody in the town did not want the Shedler neighborhood to be sitting on a commercial zone. And it was a really good purchase. And 
I literally had two babies, had just quit my job, and the housing market had collapsed, and I had bought my house in Ridgewood at the height of the market, and I fully supported this purchase. We also took money from outside of Ridgewood, $1.6 million from the county, which means no matter what goes in this park, it's a public park and anybody can come there. I know that was addressed, but we took money from outside. So in 2009, during a very scary economic time, for me, I thought this was a good purchase, and I think the sentiment, no matter who I've talked to, the neighbors, everybody felt like it was better to be preserved and turned into a park rather than commercial zone. So I, I thought that was a beautiful place to start, and I think mm -hmm. we should all remember that. I'm, I feel like I'm sitting at the end of a bad divorce. <laughs> um, in an effort to move forward, there's elements of this park that I, I'm hoping the council can write this down if you agree, that I think we should agree. Um, we want a park. That's one. Two, the house is in because we've spent an enormous amount of money. We want a future use for the house, which means there needs to be ample parking for the house. We want a pathway because it's passive and it appeals to not just the kids that have somewhat dominated the community discussion, the pathway for anybody to passively walk and be a part of. We want a playground. The playground's incredibly critical because as some of you know, I live close to town and in 1980, a park was mistakenly taken from the Woodside Park location and that created a diversion for the town. We've been in big trouble with the state because the park that was taken off of Broad Street hasn't been replaced. So we need to replace the land and the playground. I do not speak for the whole neighborhood, but the general sentiment was that we would want our playground that was taken, and it literally is taken, to go to a community that wanted. And again, going back to the discussion from the Shedler neighbors, there was always the goal for that neighborhood to have a playground and be integrated and kids could play there. So the next item would be playground, which I think we all support. We then get into the field. I feel that in the 2017 meeting and all the people, there was the idea that there would be a field there. So I think field is one. The next goes to turf. In 2017, it was decided that it would be turf. In an effort to honor that and my campaign, I'm going to recommend that it be turf. So that, I, I have to interject. The ad hoc committee preliminarily recommended. But it, it, fine, but it was yeah. approved 5-0 by a prior council. It, it, and it's on page 10. Um, then you get into turf size. And there's five of us, so you could do this like, you know, rubrics, like yes, no, yes, no, and then we could hopefully move forward. Um, lights. I'm not wedded to lights. I am concerned about the billboard, too, that was mentioned. I think that people want to use the lights to increase playing time, which is from the sports world, and I recommended the conduits in case people wanted to opt it. It seems too expensive. No one seemed to like that idea, but we should, you know, scorecard lights and see where we're at. And uh, size of the field. And I think that's what we really have. We have an, a series of iterative questions that we can all answer for ourselves. I have to be honest, when you say you're concerned about particulate matter with the highway, does that mean we don't do a playground? Does that mean that the diversion and my neighborhood never gets to clear that? Do, when we say we don't want people there and we want a buffer, do we not want to park? And you know, if I'm missing an element, I like these things. They're called rubrics. My kids talk about them all the time. You know, my, what, what to watch on TV, what to order, how we can do this. I think we have a problem and an opportunity and we should break these elements down and maybe roll call. I don't want to be bossy, but for me, you know, I've been assigned a lot of positions on this, and I, I don't want to be assigned positions that I didn't take. I don't want the neighbors to think I'm not listening. Um, in addition to 2009, one of the goals was to integrate the old Glen School neighborhood. As many of you know, I grew up in Ridgewood. I vividly remember when the Glen School was shut in 2000, uh, 1986. I was in sixth grade at Orchard School. It was, it was gonna, 86 was when it closed though and they switched to the junior high. And, and we, we switched everything to a junior high and it was very traumatic for that neighborhood. And I think that one of the goals of purchasing this property was to reintegrate it and make this park a community park in their neighborhood, which means people would go there and the, part, the community would have it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So I don't know if anybody wants to do that. I don't even know what's to be said. We've had a lot of discussion about things that we already have, but I'd like this project to move forward. I'd like those elements to be discussed and I hope that's meaningful. And if anybody thinks we've missed something, 
you know, that needs to be discussed. I think it's just a rubrics of decisions, and we have five people, and I'm fully expecting, you know, let's say size. It could be 3-2, turf could be 4-1, it could be, you know, lights. I'm not voting for lights, so it's going to be, you know, whatever, and me as the one. But we need to get back to the fact that this is a good, expensive, seriously, $7 million expensive. It's the largest capital project we have other than water. And we as a community, I, I, the passion has been overwhelming to me. The storytelling has been awesome. I'm so grateful to everybody from every side. And I just think the best way for this project to move forward is detail it, preliminarily roll call that, and move it forward. And then, let's be clear, we could do this, and SHPO could say, no way, right? You know, we've given, no offense to the prior council, we've given an enormous amount of authority to a state organization in complete darkness. No one even knew that this happened. Parks didn't know it, Fields didn't know it, Ad Hoc didn't know it. So, you know, we have to decide if we're gonna belabor that or move forward. And I, I'm hoping that the, the roll call of the elements will help us move forward. And that's it. Excuse me, excuse me. Thank you. I, I, if you have a, the roll call is listing the items, and then people can say how they feel about the items. I mean, it's a discussion. Siobhan, thank you very much. Thanks for that great summary and that great possible plan for how we move this forward. Evan, do you have anything to add? No, I, um, I want to hear more. Um, Good. You know, I, my, my goal here is to hear everyone out. Um, you know, I find that when you put yourself on the record, you leave yourself not open to reconsidering things. I agree with what a lot is being said here in terms of there is no wrong or right. I also agree that um, we are five individuals that likely have very five very strong viewpoints. I also want to thank Chris. I want to thank the rest of the department. These sketches are great. I've been to the property several times. Um, being able to see how it's laid out on paper, though, really lets you imagine how it looks. And at the end of the day, I know we have a lot more work to do, but I am confident we're going to get to the right place for the majority of the citizens. I would, I'd like to say that Going there today with Jovan really was an eye-opener when I actually physically saw the stakes and how close the large field would be to the house and how close it is to the property line on the other side and how close it is to Route 17. I really request that all of the council go there. You really need to have somebody from engineering walk it with you because it's not you know, it's not like it's roped out. Once the stakes are pointed out, then you're like, okay, you know, the um, the blue stakes are the larger field, the red stakes are the smaller one. And I was just like, this is too much. It's way too much. And I mean, I, I think looking at it, you can see it's way too much. If you had the smaller field, there would be room on the right end to have a playground, or at least it appears to be that way. And then the whole back could be a buffer for the residents. Where do you want to put the playground? Excuse me? Where do you want to put the playground? It, with the small field, I think it could go right like here. Yeah, and we, we need that proximity to the lightning strike as well. Just, I want to be, the playground, or if we're all good on the playground, we need to advocate for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think a playground is one of the most important things. Yeah. I, and I, I do worry about, you know, a playground, you're not, in, I, I mean, I wouldn't think you're huffing and puffing as much as you would as if you're playing soccer or lacrosse or football or something like that. But I, I do worry about the particulate matter as well as turf. After what I read today, I would never, ever vote for turf. And I just think that too many trees have been taken down. We need to start putting them back instead of taking down more. And I, I request that everybody go back and, you know, have somebody show them. I mean, I'll go back with anybody and show them exactly where. Like, the field is too close to the street. It's too close to the berm. 
it's too close to the right property line and it's too close to the house on the bigger field. And we could arrange for so, someone from engineering to meet you and choose to see it if that's what you wish. One of the things to remember with the element approach, if we decide, is that the grants from Bergen County for the field are due April 15th, and there's money available for outside of the house. So let's say we all agreed one element, such as, again, moving forward and deciding what we're comfortable with, the path or the playground, and taking the element discussion, we could apply and try to get relief for part of the park to be built through a grant, and that's due April 15th. I mean, if we can keep talking about the turf and the field, or we can talk about the park as a whole. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I will say, um, if you want to see kids sweat on a playground, you should take my twin nephews to one. <laughs> they really, they really can. Little kids sweat just as much as big kids playing on a playground. Okay, but then if the playground is closer, if it's further away from Route 17, and we can plant a lot more trees, I would think it would be a little bit more healthy. Yeah, agreed. We can plant lots of trees. The pleas that we are planting under the prior design are not faring so well. They're, they're not. So right. again, this is rather than poking holes and moving forward. I, I didn't plant those trees. I'm not even entirely sure the berm can retain them. I want to be honest. That I don't know if anybody, I spent a significant amount of time on the property. I think the berm has some opportunities for improvement. And I think we need, we can plant millions of trees wherever we want, but we have to decide where we're placing hardscaping. And we as a council have to commit to the elements of this design and the park that we wish to move forward. And look, I'll say it again, it doesn't have to be that way, but I would, I would welcome everyone's opinion. It seems that, you know, if we're concerned about particulate, we have to be concerned about the playground. Mm -hmm. If we're not concerned about, so we have to decide which way to move forward. Um, and if we're not going to vote yes to the playground, then we need to get real with the other neighborhood about the diversion. I don't think any of us here are knowledgeable enough about particulates. I really do think that we should have a medical expert come in and talk to us. But why now? Because, well, I never heard about it before, and, you know. So in the, in the previous discussions of Shadler, when the public was told there was a plan in place, none of these concerns existed? I don't know. I, no, I've heard Salvo talk before and ta talk about it, absolutely. And the prior council probably should have done a I mean, study with a medical the, expert. What about the house? We're going to welcome kids there. I mean, we've spent $2.3 million on the house to welcome people. Mm -hmm. and, and now we're It's saying, different if you're just walking in the house, if you're having a bridal shower or, or something else. The exercise part, I think, is the what people are saying is the danger. I know. I mean, I'm just honestly a little surprised. We've spent a significant amount of capital. So the capital expense is $7 million, of which five has been spent. And now we're saying that we have a particulate concern. I don't think anybody has ever, well, Salvo has addressed it, but nobody has ever listened to him. OK. I would not want 20 years down the road to see a cluster of something happen and then we would be, you know, I mean, who's responsible for that? So like if, we're not sometimes if we're not developing a park, we have to give money back. And I'm saying all discussions are welcome. We have to give the I'm money back. I'm not saying not develop the park. but. It doesn't have to, it, it can't be as developed as this picture that I'm looking at. Let we me, need more we have, protection. We have a responsibility, a fiduciary duty to the money that's on the table. We are in trouble with the diversion. We've been missing a playground since 1980. I'm not we, saying not to a playground, but I think a, a playground is very important. We've built a significant berm to buffer a field and the, the money we that took. That berm is not going to buffer anything. The buffer, I, I didn't approve the berm. I didn't either. Excuse me, <laughs> friends, please, let's let the council discuss this. Thank you very much. Continue. I mean, I really, I remember sitting in meetings where only, you know, only trees that had fallen were going to be taken away. There were going to be no extra trees taken down. And then all of a sudden, all these trees are down. 
the trees, I think, really helped protect the neighborhood from pollution and noise. And I do believe there should be a park here, no doubt about it. But I did the original ad hoc committee, was it supposed to be 60% passive, 40% active, or the other way around? The money that we took, we have to have a combination space, and there was no from open space criteria on the percentage. Oh, I thought so it was 60-40. No, I don't think that was in here. The other, it, it has to be a combination, and one of the things from the village side, we have 10 passive parks, and I think it's four multi-use parks. So mm -hmm. from the village's assets, we have more passive land than multi-use. But I don't think that should have anything to do with, you know, this is an individual piece of land. We should talk about it. I, as I believe the original call stands. to action and why so many people supported it was that it was going to improve the recreational side. Mm -hmm. So having a small sided field and a playground is going to improve the recreation. And a path. Uh, oh, the path, definitely. The path. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh no, go ahead. Chris, how wide is the path? It will be eight feet wide because that way we can plow it with an F-250 pickup truck. I forgot. You Same path width that we have at Havernickel where we also plow it in the winter because we have found that residents just love to walk after the snowstorm on a clear pathway. Yeah, eight foot is, is a good width because people can walk side by side. Thank you. They can also push strollers. Mm -hmm. um, it's a nice, comfortable, size and I'm gonna say we have so much to think about after tonight's meeting we're gonna put this on the agenda for next week and we will talk about it some more we will listen to more comments from the public I am so grateful that so many of you stuck around so that you can uh, participate in public comment at the end of tonight's meeting and I think that we will figure out how we're going to poll the council next week. Perhaps Siobhan's uh, suggestion might be a good way to go. But uh, Siobhan, thank you for your great summary. Pam, for your research. Uh, Lorraine, for your passion <laughs> for the neighborhood. And, uh, and Evan, for your even-handedness in wanting to hear more. So I appreciate everyone's patience and respect as we go through this, we are going to come to a decision as quickly as possible. But as, you, as we can all see, this is a tough one. So let's all work together and see if we can come up with a solution. Thank you. Let's move on. Okay. Um, Ridgewood Water. Um, the gate at the Glen Avenue facility is in disrepair and requires replacement. There were three quotes obtained. The lowest responsible quote is from National Fence Systems, Inc. of Avenel, New Jersey, not to exceed $24,740. And the funding is in the water capital budget. Oh, and forgive me. I completely forgot the most important thing, and Evan just reminded me. Chris, thank you for uh, pumping out plans as quickly as we can think of a new design that we want. And to Jovan, you guys are absolutely incredible. I know that this last plan just came through. It, we were, it was requested at 5 o'clock yesterday. So I, forgive me for interrupting, but um, that was my mistake. Thank you so much. And please Thank pass you. that along to Jovan. <laughs> we at will be end. filled, but we have, we have um, uh, the rest of our agenda to get through. Um, I'm hopeful it doesn't take long. And okay, so, were there any comments on the first item? Well, it's amazing how much a gate will cost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but otherwise, okay. it's okay by me. Okay. The next item is awarding a contract under a Bergen County contract. Um, it's for materials and supplies for water main repairs, and it's to be awarded to um, Brainstone Industries, Inc., um, and the amount is not to exceed $100,000. And that's in the water utility operating budget. Questions? Anyone? Good. Next item is awarding a professional services contract. This is the rate expert um, for the 2023 budget and water rates. 
Um, this is with Howard Woods and Associates of East Brunswick, New Jersey, not to exceed $7,320. Um, he has been used since um, the water rate case, and uh, he will assist Ridgewood Water in developing an equitable PFAS surcharge balance with the budget and any water volume rate changes for 2023. The money is in the water utility operating budget. Questions, anyone? It's very Good. reasonable. Yep. The next item is actually under policy, and um, this is the ordinances. Um, three members of Green Ridgewood don't need to serve on the green team. Sustainable Jersey doesn't require this. We want to add a stu student intern to Green Ridgewood and change the term liaison to stu for the student to intern um, and increase the number of members on Green Ridgewood by two. Um, so the, the ordinances are attached that will change those ordinances. I just want to say that the Green Ridgewood mission is so broad because there are so many different things in the environment to address that having two more people on the, on the committee will really help. Okay. Um, we already went over the um, land use ordinance. Then the next is an encroachment agreement for 22 Maynard Court. They wish to seek um, an encroachment agreement which includes a fence around a swimming pool an area of pavers and a small play area, and these um, have all existed in that location since the mid-1990s. Um, the resolution will authorize the mayor and village manager also to execute the encroachment agreement. All good? And that's all we have. What about the, um, uh, the curfew? curfew yeah. yeah, the curfew. So, um, Mayor, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, uh, I want to go through the possibility of establishing the same policy that the planning board has, which is a waivable 11 o'clock curfew. Um, many members of the council, or at least several, um, uh, their day starts early, very early. And as we can see, we have more than one hot button issue in town, and oftentimes, between hot button issues and the considerable amount of work just involved in the daily operation of the village. Um, many of these meetings run past 11, past 12, um, and they can go much later. Um, for those sitting on the council, I have, a, I have a very strong opinion that most decisions made after 11 o'clock are, are based at least partly on the fact that they just want to go home and get to bed because they have to get up at 5.30. So I open this up to the council to see their uh, thoughts on this. Pam, tell, me, tell us a little bit about the, the waivable curfew at the planning board. Well, if it looks like uh, public comment is, is going, if the meeting is going to go long, then they take a vote and if the majority wants to waive that 11 o'clock curfew, then then they do waive it. So there are exceptions. Um, you may have more experience with it than I do. And Yeah, um, I mean, the planning board is totally different than the council. It's not right. like we have an opening public comment and an ending public comment. It's if they're in the middle of an application and it's 1030 and they know they're not going to get through the app and they know that they need the applicant to come back again because they need another two hours, they'll vote to have the applicant continue um, or if they finish with an application say at 10 15 or something and then the next application is a really big one they'll yeah. say you know we're barely even going to be able to start this let's hold off and start anew so I don't think you can compare it to the planning board it's a totally different thing I don't know how we would stop a meeting if we still had more stuff on the agenda. We just don't do it. I mean, and you don't do public comment at the end. How could you possibly end a meeting? I, I, think, I think the idea is that we would try and gauge the work that we do. Yeah. We obviously wouldn't want to curtail public comment. So, you know, this would be a, if, if it was, if it was, um, the opinion of the, of the council to try this, then we would give it a try 
and see how well it worked. Because I know that the late night meetings are not a good thing. Um, and, and for those of us who are here every night, it's a tough thing. I remember there was a council member um, in the last council who had to get up at 4.30 um, every morning for work. And it was very hard on them. You know, Paul, I, I think it's more than just us. I mean, listen, we, we signed up for this, and, and I get that. I think there are a couple of reasons why I support this. The first is accessibility. Is Forget about the council members. There are lots of citizens that have to get up in the morning. They have young kids. They have jobs. Um, they're not staying up till 11, 30, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning to hear us discuss what are really important topics. And I think as a, as a you know, we've done a nice job with, with hybrid access making this more accessible. The next step is to, to keep it within a reasonable amount of time so that your average citizen doesn't have to stay up past midnight and also doesn't have to tune in for more than two or three hours to, to be a part of democracy. I also don't think it's completely fair to our village employees. Um, when we're here till 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, Heather's here that late, Matt's here that late, uh, Dylan is here that late. That means that they're not doing their jobs the next day because, rightfully so, they're sleeping in. They're not showing up, or at least they shouldn't be showing up uh, at their regular time. That's, that's time that we could give back to them. I think the way you do this is the way you do it in the private sector, is you schedule. Um, we should have, if something is on the agenda, there should be an estimated amount of time for the amount uh, of time of the, of the agenda that, that should take up. So for instance, like the ad hoc committee tonight, you know, just using that as an example, we would have them scheduled for 15 minutes. If they go longer than 15 minutes, we'd ask them to, to slow down, but at least they would know how much time they have, they can get their points out and they can plan, and we could gauge, to your point, Paul, how long these meetings should go, and if there's too much on the agenda, then we simply push it off to another day because we're not gonna get through it in a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> Also, would like to see us maybe consider putting limits. If we're going to limit how much the people can speak, we should limit maybe what some of us can speak, and maybe try to keep some of us listening more than we are speaking at times. Um, I think that's probably the way to do it. And in terms of public comments, we should absolutely have robust public comments. It occurred to me tonight that one of the things we may want to do, and again, this is a bit off the cuff, is think about maybe we just have public comments from seven to eight, and that's that is for both um, that's for both you know the comments we do before and comments we do after. Members of the council would show up at 7. We would kick off the public comments from 7 to 8, but at 8 o'clock we start the meeting. So for folks who want to tune in, know at 8 o'clock is when the testimony is going to start and when the meat of the meeting is going to start. Um, we meet three times uh, a month, most months. That's three hours of public comments a month that we'd be exposed to. I think that's fair. That's addition to the new chat, um, the new weekend chat we've started with. That's addition to the fact we're all available to our citizens. But I'd like to explore doing a set time, perhaps, for the meeting for our, our, our constituents to actually speak to us. But again, it's not fair to the village employees. It's not fair to the people that are tuning in home or coming here tonight. I mean, I see people, their eyes are glazing over. They're kind of getting frustrated because they were going on too long because everybody wants to talk about Shevler tonight and everybody now wants to get the last say in, which is exactly what you're supposed to do in democracy. Um, we should be more responsible and have a set time frame for people to, to tune in. So I would like to see us explore scheduling. I would like to see us explore um, maybe running the meetings a little differently so that we can actually have a meeting that maybe ends by 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock pretty predictably. And again, of course, if there is an emergency, if there's something that's truly, truly important, we can always waive it, but that should be the expectation going forward. Thanks, Evan. Pam? Yes, one other thing I wanted to say is, um, I'd say it about after about a third of our meetings, when this open session ends, we all go into a closed session. Which it, we, at which we address some really important things. And we can't vote during that session, but it's important for us to understand what's going on with, say, litigation uh, on behalf of the town or, or um, collective bargaining agreements with our unions or employees' uh, discipline or whatever. We need to be fully present. If, as taxpayers, I'm sure you want us to be alert and paying attention. Um, so that's another factor as well. I think we can have closed session before meetings instead of after. That would, that would solve that. And I am adamantly against removing ending public comment and just having an hour at the beginning. People want to speak at the end about what happened during the meeting while it's fresh in their mind. They don't want to wait a week to comment on something that happened at the meeting last week. Ending public comment is so important and it happened because a resident requested it, Roger Wygant, and I think there's still a sign on 
the podium that I forget what it says, but it's Roger saying that the resident should always have the last say or something like that. And I completely agree with that. It would be a travesty to take away ending public comment. Well, nobody's saying ending public comment. We're saying we'd expand it and move it to its set section. And it's, again, it's just a proposal. Um, but to your point, you know, that's great. But how many people are sticking around to 1230 at night to have the last say? They I mean, do. It, it's not fair. <laughs> It's, there they yeah. are. Look at all these people but here. It's, but it's not, I mean, it's not fair to all the other citizens that have to get up the next morning, to have to tell them that, you know, you've got to wait till 1230. We should, be end, we should be running these meetings the way, you know, the way we do in the private sector, is that you have a set amount of time, you're expected to, compl to conclude within that set amount of time, and if you can't conclude within that set amount of time, then you need to schedule differently. I think you're cutting out openness and the ability for people to speak their mind. That, that's what the public meetings are for. We want to hear from the residents. It's beyond mind-boggling that, <laughs> that you could even think that having it just in the beginning is okay. People need to speak at the end if something happened during the meeting that they want to talk about. Siobhan? Um, so I'm a big fan of public comment. As many of you know, before I sat up here, I was a frequent public commenter. And I think um, the more we, as a council, can engage with the public, the better. Um, I kind of like our structure. I think it goes well. I think that you know we, myself included, I, I look, I, I drank a Diet Coke. I'm going to be here all night. I will call you early tomorrow. I'm not the best sleeper, so I'm not the best reference. Um, to make this a little lighter, I, there's several members of the council who have told me I can't call before, I think, 9 a.m., and I ignore it every day and call them anyway. I think public comment is a beautiful thing. Um, I think every time I sit up here, I meet a new person. I learn something, and I think we should listen to that. I think when you know, you don't have access to your local government, which is what Ridgewood's coming off of. There were no office hours. There was, um, you know, a, a different style. I think we have the opportunity to engage. I do feel for our staff. Um, I can bring an unhealthy Diet Coke, but I see no point in changing it right now. I will say that how we schedule it could be better. I like Lorraine's idea of preloading um, the, um, the closed session. And I do like the idea. One question I've always had is, why are we starting public meetings at 8 and all the other meetings at 7.30? Because so I'm fine with anything, but, you know, today we had a closed session that was canceled. So from like 6.30 to 7.30, I was like, I'm ready. Where do I go? So because um, I didn't really want to be late to a meeting. But I do like the idea of us scheduling our time and front-loading closed. I think that's a good idea that's invisible to the public. And I do like the idea if we're allowed to, and I don't know if it'll mess you up, Heather, because you've released the schedule for the year. I like the idea of all the meetings being consistently at 7.30. Um, rather than it, just, you know, workshops are at 7.30 and public meetings are at 8. And that's like my secret code, so I'm never, I don't like being late to anything. It's a real big thing. So I, I think it's working. I think the public is here. I appreciate the public. Just a couple weeks ago I was a member of it, and I'm fine with it. And I think we could um, do things to buffer our schedule better. I like the idea of closed earlier. I think that's a quick win for us. Um, and that's it. Pam? It's unfortunate that the Open Public Meetings Act doesn't help us more in, in structuring our meetings, but that is the reason why we have public comment at all. Um, it is for the openness of it. So I think we came up with some great ideas tonight. Um, you know, uh, Evan, I had not thought about it in terms of the fact that Tonight is really an exception because the three of you who are usually here at the end of the night, and you know who you are, um, are usually the only ones, and occasionally you're not here either. Um, occasionally. Um, almost no one stays till the end of the night. Um, and I'm sure that after 11 o'clock, a lot of people who are watching on TV are no longer watching. That's an important consideration. Um, village staff. Um, I have said to um, members of village staff um, when we've gone late, how do you do it in the morning? 
It's very hard. It's hard on, it's hard on a lot of people. Um, like Siobhan, I'm a giant fan of public comment. Agree with me, disagree with me, come with your passion, tell us what you think, because that's how we better understand what's going on. We don't know everything. Oh, you already knew that, right? Um, so I, I think that we can make s some improvements. I don't believe that because this is the way it's been done for a thousand years that that's the way it should be done for the next thousand years. Uh, some great, um, and, and by the way, in terms of public comment, at the very first meeting um, behind Siobhan's leadership on this, we made public comment better. Um, we improved the acoustics, we moved the podium, we put the clock up, um, we have greater utilization of the screens. Everyone likes public comment. Um, so the goal would be to do this without impacting public comment. And so what I would propose, oh, by the way, and I also love, I, I think it's a fait accompli, and, and, I'll, and I'll poll everyone, um, closed session before the meeting? Mm -hmm. Is everyone in favor that's of that? Easy. That's easy. That's a, well, that, that certainly helps. I just want to make a comment. There are times closed session goes long, and so you don't know how long it's going to go. And so, you know, we could start at 6 o'clock. That's not a problem. But, you know, just be ready that we may have to still have closed at the end. And I think your, your point is well taken, and I know that, that, that you're a very good judge of um, how long these things will take, even I though try. it's a... I try, yeah, it's a, but it, it's I, a, you can't always predict It's it. a guessing game. It but, is. you know, I, I certainly think that, that you know, if we, if we generally started at 6.30 and if you thought that we should come in earlier, mm -hmm. even at 5.30, mm -hmm. to get it done, I think that everyone would rather be doing this on the front end okay. than the back. Um, uh, Siobhan's other suggestion about beginning all our meetings at 7.30. Okay, the reason for it is because that's a public meeting. There are public hearings, and it was always felt that people who worked it might be easier for them to get here at 8 o'clock than 7.30. We do have a pre-meeting at 7.30, as you know. We'd have to do that at 7 and change it to 7.30. But it was really because that's the time when the public gets the most chance to speak because the public hearing is on ordinances, uh, public hearings on the budget, um, and that's always done at a public meeting. And so that's why it's always been 8 o'clock. We can change it. I'm not saying we can't. Right. But it's certainly something to take into account. Not as many people commute as, as far as they used to. However, several do still go to work, and they still do commute to New York City or to other places that are further from home. So, you know, it's just something to consider, and that was the thought behind it, and that's why it's 8 o'clock for the public meeting. Right. And, and, and I, but I, I, I really do believe that, you know, there, there is a primetime audience and we're going to lose a lot of that prime time audience as we go later. And so here's what I'm going to recommend. First, that we, we institute um, having our closed session early. Next, that we begin all, uh, our public meetings at 7.30 also. And we do a pilot for three months with a waivable 11 o'clock curfew. The goal, again, would be not to impact public comment on the beginning or the end. I would keep, I'm, I'm recommending that we keep it at the end, even though I, I have a feeling that more people would engage if it was longer and in the beginning, because as we've already seen, many people who were in line have left. They had their passion, they had their criticism, but they want to go home. So, you know, this, this is, I believe, a good way for us all to see how this works. And if at any time we think we're going to go over, we take a vote, and if a majority of the council says, let's go over, or let's continue to finish this item or the next, then we do it. I mean, I would just also ask, I do think we should start instituting a policy of having an expected time for the presentations. So we do least, actually. It's like ten minutes max. I mean, it's, at least put it. We'll put it on the on the um, yeah. on the agenda then. So okay. we expect fifteen minutes okay. here, ten minutes here. So at least the folks who are speaking can prepare. They're told. Yeah. It, so, it, it, they are told, I, but then there's discussion amongst the council, and there's questions, and then it runs long. Well, let's and let's let's. I think Evan's suggestion is a good one. 
Let's mm -hmm. let's put it on the agenda okay. so that once it's written, it becomes easier to follow for mm -hmm. everyone. So because we don't want to be cutting people off um, and making it look like it's because we like or don't like what you're saying. So the other thing is the agenda will have to change. Um, we're not going to have the the different delineations. The uh, you know, different um, subject matter. It's going to just be one big agenda. I'm going to put all the things that have to be considered, mm -hmm. such as award of contracts, um, things that we have to take action on Paying the at bills. the public meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll all be at the beginning, mm -hmm. and then the other stuff will be at the end. So the other stuff, it may take a couple of meetings to get to those discussion things. And, and so many of those things, by chance, are things that could be put off. Mm -hmm. For example, this the communication pre presentation, while we want to get to it as soon as possible, the Shedler discussion, we want to get to it as soon as possible, it could be put off. Not to say that it should or that it will, but those are things that we can decide at the time based upon the amount of time that's left. So um, I'm going to ask Heather, would this, would this need to be done by ordinance? We, what we need to do is we have to readopt the, um, pub the public meeting notice, and then it has to be sent to the newspaper. So we would have to wait till March 8th to change it. So I think for March, we'd have to stay up till March 8th, our public meeting. It okay. would stay the same. And then after that, as far as closed, we can do it early. That's fine. Good. I mean, that's just a, a special public meeting notice that we'd have to send out. If, if we don't have enough time, though, to notice it, then it would still have to be at the end. So, mm -hmm. Heather, could, could can I ask I one just, question? Mm -hmm. With the closed, can we, can we start mm -hmm. closed and then suspend it and go back to closed? Is that legal? You that, can go at the end. Okay. Yeah, That's and you don't have to suspend it. You can, you can adjourn out of that closed session and then go into it. And a start new a new one. one. Okay. And just continue, right? Can I just ask you to repeat, what did you say about the public, about Evan's comment about public comment at the beginning from seven to eight? Oh, I, 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 thought, it was, I thought it was a good idea, but it's not what I'm proposing. Okay. I'm proposing keeping that as is, which is in the beginning and at the end, and we do this for a three month period, and then we assess how it goes. Because I think there are a lot of ideas here that I just heard for the first time tonight, and, and I, think they're, I think they're good ones. And we can, we can pass this, or again, if the, if the council agrees, we can pass this on March 8th. We've front-loaded our meetings so that we can, we'll get here earlier. We're not gonna put in any less time. Um, we're just gonna do it earlier when maybe we're fresher. Well, I'm not gonna be here on March 8th, and I'm just gonna say I am against having the public meetings move to 7.30 because oh. I will have a very hard time getting here at 7. I mean, on the, um, we don't have closed session every week, but it's, it's a problem for me. <laughs> and, 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 and again, this is one of those things that it's, and, and again, for, 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 for those who have other commitments, which we all have other commitments, getting here earlier is gonna be tricky. <laughs> For those of us who have other commitments, getting here later is uh, staying here later is tricky. But for, Lorraine, you can for, the, for the public, for the public, um, I have a feeling we will we will get um, a greater audience at seven than we will at eleven. Well, it's not going to be at seven. seven it's it's gonna would be, be at seven thirty. Yeah, because yeah. we, we have, have to be here right. at yes. seven. Yes. And Lorraine, so I will if, if you're come not at seven twenty-five, <laughs> and you okay. tell me when to speak. If you're not going to be here, too, for any reason, you know, one of the discussions today was you can dial in. Yeah, didn't we just vote on this? We did. In a very unusual circumstances is what it said. Okay. Do, do we have to give our street address when we dial in? No. <laughs> I'm going to be on vacation. I'm not dialing in. I'm sorry. Good for you. Okay. Um, Heather, I have a question about how the agenda will be set up if in this new situation. Would Ridgewood Water still be separate from yeah, the Yeah, Ridgewood Water would be first still. Yeah, because I still they, like They that. don't usually have a lot. And again, it's done for the benefit of any other towns who may want to, you know, um, yeah. focus in on that particular subject matter. But um, then everything else would be in order of having to take action at a public meeting. So 
what's your pleasure? Um, is everyone in favor of this, or is anyone opposed? As a, as a three-month pilot beginning as soon as Heather can implement it, which I believe would be after the March 8th meeting. I don't, I don't know. I mean, we're going to let the status quo and just change the times, yes? We're not. No, no, and, and also put in the waivable curfew. I mean, I'm okay with a pilot, but I'm going to move probably not to waive. I just want to be honest in the discussion. And that's, okay. and that's, and that's fine. I mean, fine. I'm fine with it because I want to be collegial, and like, I think that seems like a compromise, but, but I, I'm going to say. No waiver. Yes. No See, I'm going to defer to Matt Rogers, and then I'm going to call him early in the morning. You do anyway. <laughs> so, so are you in favor of this proposal? I, I look, I, I want us to move forward. I mean, I'm a little, you know, having all these rules, I'm, I, I use this with my kids so they understand scope. Don't have rules that you're not prepared to enforce. And I think we should be grateful for the people who come to do presentations and not put a pressure cooker to them. A lot of volunteers spend time and this is nerve wracking for people. Um, yeah, I'm fine. I mean, if the majority feels that way, I just feel that the public needs to be heard. I feel like we can go the distance and if we appropriately set up the agenda and manage the agenda, you know, I think we can do better. Good. So it sounds like, I don't want to misinterpret, you're in favor of the three-month pilot with those uh, proposals that I laid out. Yeah. I Great. Am. Evan? Uh, yes. Pam? Yes. Lorraine? I'm with Siobhan. I'm like, eh. <laughs> Is it, just, just give me a yes or no. Eh. <laughs> well, I'm... There are I'm, certain things I'm, that I'm okay I'm, with, but there are certain things that I'm not. I don't think we should limit public comment at all. I don't think we should end a meeting because it's 11 o'clock and we've got people that want to speak. I don't think we should stop a presentation where somebody has worked hours and hours on it because they went, <clears throat> they were given 10 minutes and they took 20 minutes. And, and, and I believe the proposal was, was A, a pilot, and B, the, that we would not cut public comments short. I specifically said that. So, and, and we'll see how this works. I mean, that's the idea is we're changing a bunch of things. We try it for three months. We see how it works. Maybe at the end of those, that three months, we keep the whole thing, we scrap the whole thing, or we keep certain parts of it that worked well. So should I, I ask again? Shot. You give it a shot. <laughs> Good, let's give it a shot. Great. And everybody's, everybody's got to know that this is not a formal vote because it's a work session tonight. <laughs> this is just expressing the interest to try this pilot out. Absolutely. And there will be a formal vote on March 8th. Mm. Yes, at the next public meeting. Right. And I'm just getting a consensus as to whether or not right. I mean, it I just should want, be put on the agenda to be voted upon officially. I want, I want everybody to understand, particularly in the public, that this is not a vote because it is a, it's a work session. Oh. So we're, we're just polling the, polling the, the That's all it is. That's all it is. So, so if anybody changes their, their opinion between now and March 8th, that's when it really counts. So I think we're done with that. And so now we will return to public comment. <laughs> we will. I'm we gonna, will. I'm going to so. wave it into tomorrow. <laughs> as in, as in I, I will say just... Here we go. We were supposed to do a stretch. Yes, would you turn that back the way it was before it was turned the wrong way? Thank you. Why did she turn it that way? Okay. Uh, Hans Jürgen Lehmann, 234 Union Street. Good evening. I promise not to talk about Shadler. This council finds itself with the opportunity to fill two important positions in the village, a new village manager and a new police chief, once Chief Luthke retires in the very near future. As you well know, our village manager holds a commanding job overseeing all operations in the village and the employees charged with carrying them out. It would seem to me that a person's ethical behavior is essential in such a leadership position. The candidate should have a track record of managing 
a large workforce and have the ability to understand budgeting and human resource management. You don't have to do it all, but you need to know what your managers are doing. Our new police chief will have a difficult job, not only filling Chief Lufke's shoes, but also steering our police department through difficult times. Police departments all over the nation are faced with difficult choices in what direction police departments ought to take. Though we may think that Ridgewood is in a better place somehow than other communities in New Jersey, I believe that is not necessarily so. In the past, we used to see police officers going about town, either in person or on bicycles, and it was possible to know the officers personally. Now, our officers are heavily armed and armored. They ride around in black police vehicles with blacked out windows. When they are at Van Ness Square, they keep to themselves, often in groups of three or four. I long for the days when I could know an officer by name and say a quick hello and how are you? It just doesn't feel that way anymore. When this council is looking for a new police chief, please ask the candidates about their position on community policing. Ask them about professionalism in the ranks, about accountability to the residents of Ridgewood, and perhaps most importantly about transparency. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. I just want to take a moment to say that while it is the choice of the council to pick the manager, it is the choice of the manager to pick the police chief. The village council does, does not make that choice. Good evening. Um, I'm Catherine Schmidt. One Catherine, could you speak into the mic, please? Find my notes first. Yes, I'm Catherine Schmidt, uh, 123 South Irving Street. So in my tradition, today is a day when one says mea culpa, and I am definitely feeling that sentiment. I am sorry that I did not stay closer to the Shedler property transaction. Like many others, <clears throat> I thought it was wrapped up when the council passed Resolution 18-236 adopting the 2017 compromise plan a plan where everybody got something, but everyone gave up something, and a plan that I understand included input from the neighbors who live close to the property. By the way, I'm also extremely happy that these comments are still relevant. <clears throat> I was worried that <clears throat> something else was gonna happen. Um, I would urge everyone, um, Councilwoman uh, Reynolds mentioned it, but I would urge everyone, not just council people, but also residents, um, to drive to the corner of West Saddle River Road and Terhune and imagine if some version of this happened in your neighborhood. When you do, you will understand my mea culpa. Changes have been made in the 2017 plan, but that should not negate the underlying concept of the plan, which was a compromise with neighbors who probably would have preferred more trees and no field. I know that if I lived there, that's what I would have lobbied for. The fact that the neighbors agreed to a sports field was probably because it was a smaller one. And today, with what appears to be little input from the neighbors, a full-size field still seems to be back on the table. And one thing this will do for certain is cut down even more trees. No doubt much has changed in our village, our country, and our world since the property was purchased and since the plan was adopted. So maybe things do need to be rethought. But if we are willing to consider changes that further develop the property, then I think we also need to give equal consideration to changes that might require even less development. Things may have changed in terms of flooding and greater needs for sports field, but things have also changed significantly regarding our knowledge of the importance of trees, clearly stated in our master plan, uh, sorry, and the problem of particulate, noise, and light pollution. This property has served as a buffer between the neighborhood and Route 17 and while that may not have been the reason it was purchased, perhaps that too needs to be revisited. Like others, I have to ask, are we using our current fields effectively? I live right near Brookside Field. It's not a great example because I know it floods occasionally, but it's used maybe, it seems to me, two months in the spring and six to eight weeks in the fall. If this is happening here at that field, then how many other fields are being underutilized? Is there enough demand that it requires the cutting down of so many buffer trees? Might there be other options to explore for shared services 
shared field services. I know that the suggestion to have less development may seem like a non-starter because we are obligated to develop the property with certain stipulations because of how we funded the acquisition. But might there be financial solutions we could explore to undevelop the property without defaulting on our obligations? I have a few ideas, but I don't want to exceed my time limit. In conclusion, if the needs of the sports groups are driving you to look at the changes that will further develop the property, then you cannot ignore the group called the neighbors. However, if you want to move fast, then I would urge you to stick to the concepts of the original plan. Just moving to another topic. Um, I think all the comments about trying to make the meeting perhaps more efficient in order to make them shorter are wonderful. But there's a part of me that says, why do you have to pass an ordinance to just manage your agenda differently? Why can't you just have a soft launch of this pilot without going through making it a law or an ordinance? It scares me as a, part, as a participant, as a resident, to think that we're going to put something into an ordinance that has to be unraveled rather than just experiment with it, try to finish at 11 o'clock, figure out why you don't, and then we can move on from there. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Rorick Hallaby, uh, 1 Franklin Avenue. Terrific meeting. And one way of shortening the meeting is perhaps for some of, some of my friends on the uh, dais to speak less. A lot of hot air. Anyway, as far as Shadler, uh, uh, there's no mea culpa from my point of view because for the last six years I have followed Shadler diligently. And uh, in a few words, it is an unmitigated, colossal $7.2 million disaster. The house, the berm, the complications, the cost, the inefficiencies, etc. Now, what to do? I'm of two minds. One, go back to the drawing board and start afresh. Unfortunately, this is not a practical option. What I suggest is a more practical approach. Complete the sports section with a full-sized, multi-purpose playing field, and yes, it can be fit. That is a better use to a larger segment of Ridgewood's population. Let's not forget Northeast Ridgewood is still Ridgewood, and I'm just as entitled to play there as I am on any field as they are in playing on my fields. Complete the Shedler House as quickly as possible. Do the best to rent it out, and if this is not possible, I would just mothball it, or whatever that means, for a future generation to figure out what to do with it. I know enough about the house to say, good luck finding a use for it, good luck. He ain't going to find a use for it. It's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, think through a plan for the berm. I'm glad that one of you mentioned the fact that it's something I've been saying for a long time, that the berm occupies one out of the seven acres. What a waste of space. What a waste of space. Ludicrous waste of space. Now, to make lemonade out of lemons, I have contacted uh, two firms that specialize in road work and mine tailing remediation restoration. Let's see what we can do with the berm and have one acre of trees, bushes, etc. Fourth thing I would do is acquire the property next to the Shedler property. It could be used for parking and allow an ingress and egress further away from Route 17. I'm always, uh, again, as one of you mentioned, I'm very, very uncomfortable with the entrance to the park being so close to the exit from 17. I think if we buy that property, we can have the entrance all the way at the end. <coughs> now, concurrently with this, I suggest you undertake the following. Work with a forensic auditor to look at how and where the funds <coughs> the 7.2 million were expended. I mean, 
we are talking about windows that cost a thousand bucks a piece, but yet at the same time, looking at the house from the outside, the windows have the storm windows that look so cheap. Uh, I would also hire an independent forensic attorney who would review the whole relationship with Shippo, the how, the when, and the why. I feel very uncomfortable with what I have seen take place. Lastly, I would establish a Blue Ribbon Citizens Committee to oversee this effort. The committee will start out with a thorough visit to the property and the house, finished or not. I'd love all of us to be able to see the inside of the house. Thank you. And by the way, I love the way, Paul, you run these meetings. They're so quiet, they're so nice, they're so gentle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rourke. Hello to people I know and good evening and to those I don't know. My name is Linda Koch, uh, 60 North Hillside Place. Um, I came here a little bit anxious because I thought what was originally uh, approved by that resolution was in jeopardy. And now I'm wondering, was I right? Is it in jeopardy? I'm not really sure what's happening. I thought that there was a very reasonable um, uh, considering due process, et cetera, a very extensive uh, research done on addressing the needs of the, the village, addressing the needs of the, the people that live there, as well as the sports people, that there was a good compromise made and a smaller field, playgrounds needed, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't really understand what I'm seeing here tonight, so I guess I need to be brought up to speed with that at some point. Um, but what I really want to what touches for me is, is the environmental harm. Um, that this is a, it's a full ecosystem that's there of wildlife, and I found out from the work that was done in for the um, application for this grant that was pro proposed, was that um, it's indeed a foraging ground for four bald eagles, which are New Jersey engendered species, and three black cro crowned night herons which are threatened species and, and protected vegetation. Who knew? I really didn't know all these things. It was so enlightening. But what was also enlightening was what some of the folks brought up this evening that I didn't think about. I know that I wouldn't want my children to play on that turf. I wouldn't want my grandchildren, future grandchildren, to play on that turf or anybody I know. I think that um, also when you're talking about the trees being taken out, we have to acknowledge that this is, we live in the times of, I think there's global warming, <laughs> but we have to address that those trees are sucking up the ground that would be flooding. Perhaps the fourth, there was not enough foresight in those fields that were proposed that are on turf so that the ground would be flooding. Maybe it was the wrong place to put them, but let's play the long game here. Let's think about the future of our children, that we, it's very important to just get this right and to not also, to not also take into consideration um, environmental harm is serious and I think it's uh, is consequential and we need to look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Good evening, Ann Loving, 342 South Irving Street. I have a few comments in no particular order. The first is, the Sunshine Law does not prohibit a speaker from saying someone's name. Just like the Open Public Meetings Act does not permit four elected officials from excluding a fifth from a discussion and decisions about one employee. But therefore, I would specifically like to thank Councilwoman Reynolds by name for apologizing to those of the public who were not allowed to speak initially. That was just embarrassing. Typically, there are very few people here, as we all know. So typically, the public comments don't go for very long. For a mayor who speaks all the time about wanting to hear from everyone, it was just shocking that these people were made to sit down. And yes, some of them left because as Councilman White's pointed out, people have to go home. It's not just the members of the elected body, but members of the public have to go home to their families, go to sleep for their jobs. 
So that, I appreciated that apology. The report from the Communications Committee, the first slide talked about transparent, open communication. Well, one thing for sure, website notwithstanding, is that communication can be improved by letting everybody who wants to speak, speak. Not at necessarily at private little coffees where you're not allowed to tape and no minutes can be taken, but at these public meetings where everybody can hear it and it's on YouTube the next day. I also do not agree with the idea of moving, of eliminating the final public comments. Um, I can read the plaque here from Roger Wigand who was my husband's best friend. And the comment which Lorraine had almost exactly right is the public should always have the final word. Definitely don't want to eliminate the end comments because so many of the comments have to do with what was said or discussed during the meeting. I would also like to thank Councilwoman Perrin, by name, for her sensible comments about the myriad hazards of turf. And I would like to add, as a retired clinical microbiologist, that we saw terrible, horrible infections from skin tears that people got, soccer players in particular, on turf. They literally ripped their skin, and then they'd get infections. And anyway, you just can't cover an historic property with a big rubber rug. I mean, come on, let's not put turf over there, and let's go for the smaller field. The mayor is often heard to say that decisions are going to be made quickly on this Shedler change of plan. But not too long ago, I heard him say that you can do something fast or you can do something right. Well, let's do this Shedler thing right. Let's do the smaller field. Let's do grass on the field, not turf. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ann. Denise Lima, 319 East Glen Ave. A um, few comments. Can't read my own handwriting. Pam, um, you talked about a new energy company that uh, is going to give residents like an, another opportunity or an offset to PSENG. Yep. Um, is it something the town is sponsoring or endorsing, or, you're, or how is that coming about? Um, we can answer your comments at the, your questions oh, right, at right. the end. Okay. Yeah, good. Uh, I didn't hear anything about sponsoring or endorsing. Uh, the Communications Committee website, looking forward to that. Um, I would be happy to write any of the content for the website about the history of Ridgewood. So you can call on me. Happy to do that. Um, the pilot uh, 11 o'clock, um, I appreciate how late you guys work, completely understand <laughs> the need to cut it off at some time. I like the idea of a pilot. Um, I don't think it needs to be an ordinance. I, I think try it. That's what a pilot is. Um, I think we need um, public comments in the beginning at the end, just like lawyers have closing comments. If we took that away from you, I don't think you would be happy. Um, so I like that there's compromising and thinking about different ways to do things. So I, I appreciate that, that feedback. Um, Shedler, <clears throat> uh, just a few points. Um, Siobhan, I think you talked about, you know, write to you and, you know, you'll, you'll put some stuff on the website. I've done that. Uh, you told me to ask the village manager to get the information and you weren't very forthcoming about it. So just let me know which way to work around that. Um, and anything that you're having side conversations about, bonds or requests, should be transparent, like you've always advocated for, and I would just ask that they get posted on the Village website. Um, and then on to, this is a sports complex. I don't see that this is a park. I don't see trees. I don't see a calming walk space that isn't next to parking spaces with people coming and going. I don't see a playground that is going to be serene for children right next to the bathrooms. 
I, I don't see this as a park. I don't see picnic tables. I see all the trees cut. I, I'm not sure where the house is anymore on this lot. I think this is total encroachment against the house. I think the state, and I've heard from many people from the state, I must say, in the last week, that they're not happy with a larger field at all. So I don't know when you plan on going to SHPO or starting those conversations, but this is, I don't think this is what people are expecting. I don't see the quality of life for the neighborhood. I don't even live there. But I can tell you subdividing a flag lot and what I had to go through is minor compared to what these people are going to experience. And I don't hear anybody saying quality of life for the neighbors. We all want kids out. We don't want them tied to the computer. We don't want them inside the house. Nobody is disagreeing with that. Um, but I don't see the compromise for the neighbors. And I don't see this as a park. I don't see dimensions. I can't see how big the park is. This is all macadam at this point. I don't see sewers, uh, so I don't see where the drainage of the water is going to go because Chris hasn't done any um, stormwater management. Um, it's really hard to tell, and all we see is a site plan yet again. And I was here earlier saying we don't see the due diligence of road work, parking spaces, safety. We're making, it seems like a decision to fit the square peg in a round hole without all of that due diligence. And I'm not saying take more time. We all want to be agile. We all want to move fast on this. But there's some compromise and level. And this is all that Chris, and when I say all, it's a lot of work. Let me take that back. This is a lot of work to do this. But where is all of that other due diligence? I, I think that's what we're all looking for. And it's still not there. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Good evening, uh, Robert Koch, 60 North Hillside Place. Uh, I came here, I haven't been here in multiple years, uh, so uh, you said you don't answer questions till the end, but how formal, informal is this meeting? I, I don't see a stenographer here. Is, what's, is this an official meeting that there's going to be a transcript to? So how does that, no, it's not an official meeting. I mean, so, so I just. No, uh, there's no transcript taken. No transcript, but it's an official meeting that I can review. So it's a work on session, it's a council work session. So I can review this on YouTube, there's, okay. Uh, I would just suggest that I didn't know who this gentleman was, I haven't been here in years, and I finally figured out through all the conversations, it was Chris in the engineering department. I would have appreciated a formal introduction who this gentleman was for people who don't know who would like to get interested in it. I also don't know what a SHPO is, but luckily I ran out of power on my phone, so I, I apologize for that. But a SHPO is a State Historic Preservation Office, and I'm still confused whether the original plan from 2017 has SHPO approval or not. It does not. It does not. It does not. All right, so you're back to square one, basically. Yes, so the two, I'll just Spot. answer it. 2017 was never submitted to SHPO. Okay. So, so, can I at least understand that this plan was, had the general consensus of the neighbors in that neighborhood? Okay. So then uh, I'm going to segue into my other two comments. I uh, ride my bike all over the place. Some people know that. And um, I realized looking at the map that West Saddle River Road, that section is a very tranquil section. You don't even know you're next to 17 there. So when I go on a bike ride up to Rockland County and back, I come back and I purposely take a left turn on Lower Road and ride through West Saddle River Road because it's so peaceful and tranquil and there's people walking there with their dogs and they always say hello and they're very kind and nice. And it's my favorite part of Ridgewood to visit because I live way on the west side. So I have absolutely no NIMBY interest in Shedler, but I did get a phone call that Shedler's in play today. So I just want to say I would defer to the consensus of the neighbors what they want to do with Shedler, and I sincerely doubt they want a gargantuan sports complex in their backyard. I don't think they want it, and I don't think it makes any sense. And lastly, this debate about uh, turf. Uh, there's a great 
quote from a baseball player, Richie Allen, in the 70s. Uh, if a horse can't eat it, I don't want to play on it. That's all I got to say. Thanks. Robert, thank you so much. And first, may I say, welcome back. Glad you're here. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, will, I will tell you that um, all of these meetings are recorded, and you can get them on YouTube. You can't come back to the mic, unfortunately. That's just... At, and, and, and just to bring you up to speed on, on the Shedler discussion, because you kind of walked in in the middle of this is that the reason for the discussion, whether you agree with it or not, is that um, we only have a few full-size sports fields. During every major storm that we get, um, they flood. And when they do, and there are several of them that are all in the same floodplain, and, um, and in the last two years, those fields have flooded five times. And what happens is then all children, not just the varsity kids, all children are affected because the varsity gets bumped off the big fields onto small fields that don't suit them, and it's an issue. And that's what we're discussing, and that's why we are discussing it now, because, because the, the situation has changed because of climate change, we are reexamining this before we take a final vote on what to put on that field because since Ridgewood is so densely populated, um, I am told that the last time we put a new field into operation was 1980. Odds are we're not going to get another chance for a very long time. So just to bring you up to speed on that. So are there any other public comments? There, there's one. I, that from the letter we received? Yes. That we, we, okay, so we all received a letter. This is obviously not me, and it's to be read in, and I wanted to wait to the end because I didn't want to bump anybody up. So, dear council members, Perrin, Reynolds, Vagianos, Whites, and Winograd, this is Jen Lee, and I live at 561 Bennington Terrace. I'm unable to attend the next council work session in person or virtually and wanted to share my thoughts about the Shedler property, which I pass every day as I walk and drive in and out of my neighborhood. If you need to read this letter at the next meeting to enter it in the record, please do so. As long as the Village Engineering's office rendition of the property with a full-size lacrosse soccer field does not displace the playground, I continue to support putting a full-size field at Shedler. Each of my three children participated in sports, rec, travel, freshman, JV, and varsity. When Ridgewood bought the Shedler property in 2009, I eagerly looked forward to enjoying a park there with them. Today, my oldest is in her third year of living and working in the city, and my youngest is a freshman in college. Even when my children were playing, I remember the difficulty of getting field time for older kids. I could share story after story about dangerous fields crafted out of makeshift plots and canceled practice. I don't need to be convinced that our youth athletes need another full-size field. I also support a turf field. If we're going to build a field there, we should get as much use out of it as possible. When Hurricane Ida hit in September 2021, Vets Field was flooded and damaged. I worked near Vets and I saw how long it took to get Vets back in shape. Vets was not ready for practice in the spring of 2022 sports. We're talking months. The high school stadium was back in action in the fall of 2021. A few heavy days of rain leaves the grass unplayable for too long and then overuse does the same. Ask anyone about citizens. I would like to address an issue some residents have raised. Noise from Route 17 makes Shedler in, inhospitable to competitions. I attended a varsity baseball game at Morristown High School a year ago, and only after the game did I realize the field sits right along 287. That's a major interstate during rush hour. I did not notice any noise traffic. My point is, there are solutions to problems we're talking about. I'm simply tired of we can't, and I'm encouraged that our council seems to embrace we can. Thank you for taking the time to discuss the opportunity we have at Shedler. I ask that you move forward as quickly as possible, making smart choices that take into the counts of the whole village and me and my neighborhood who live right nearby Shedler. Respectfully yours, Jin Lee, 561 Bennington Terrace. And forgive me, I did not notice we have two people on the line. Um, Lori Weber, 
you're first. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Thank Welcome you. Welcome back. It's Lori Weber, once again, 235 South Irving Street. Um, as a person who has been accused many times of being long-winded, and I embrace my long-windedness, um, I often find myself having to condense my thoughts, my many thoughts, into three or four minutes, depending on which body of our local government I am addressing. And I will tell you that it, it's a great exercise because uh, less truly is more. I usually make a better statement when I whittle it down to the essentials. And so on the subject of your lengthy meetings, I'm sorry to report that some of you are also a bit long-winded. Um, you do tend to go in circles a bit, um, repeat yourselves a bunch of times. And I'm only saying that not because I wanna criticize you, but because instead of only putting, just putting the onus on everyone else who's coming to address you, I think you could also kind of look to yourselves and think about, gee, did I already say that two or three times? Do I need to embellish it? You know, I'm just saying it in terms of the meeting flow and the length of it. It's something that I found really helpful with myself and, and I'm gonna throw it back at you. Um, on the topic of mentioning names of people uh, during a public comment, that feels like censorship to me. And I would ask where that rule is because I didn't see it and, and what it's for because I, I don't understand why simply mentioning a name is a, necessarily a bad word. It was done many, 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 many times over many years that I've attended these meetings without anyone saying a word about it. Um, as I said earlier, our former mayor, I mean, there are people who yelled at her um, from the other side of the room saying her name over and over again. Um, so I don't get that. And, you know, if the, if the council can refer to other people and people's names, I don't understand why the public then is subject to that type of limit. Um, the council member to my right of the mayor, who I can't name apparently, um, she just read a letter into the record. Um, I didn't really notice in the beginning if she gave the name and address of the person who made the comment, but <laughs> that's an interesting point. I mean, if it's a if it's a public comment, the name and address certainly should have been mentioned. I don't know if it stayed within the five minute limit or not, but I think council members reading comments like that isn't necessarily the best practice. Um, it's not fair. Um, and I think that either you're kind of caught in that conundrum um, that council member in the pink sweater should either have said the name of the resident but if she did, she would have broken your rule about using names. So I don't see why using the names of any of the people that are sitting up there is a dirty word. Interestingly, I mentioned Ms. Maylander's name many, many times, and you did not stop me. But when I said that other person's name, it was like I, it was like I used profanity. And I, it just seems kind of silly to me that I had to refer to her as a certain member of the council. I mean, isn't that silly? So anyway, that's it for tonight. And thank you. And I agree, public comment at the end is the best. Uh, so I'm glad that you're still uh, willing to keep that. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Lori. Uh, and I just want to take, we have someone else. We have a couple of people um, uh, on hybrid access. I just want to take a moment to um, respond to what you said about why we don't allow the public to utilize the name of council members. Um, this is not a policy of this council. This is a policy that has been in effect long before I think any of us ever got here. Um, and whether it was enforced or not is up to that council. Uh, as everyone has heard me say on more than one occasion, we're looking for a respectful dialogue. And when someone offhandedly mentions someone's name uh, in, in a positive vein, uh, we try not to 
enforce it so strictly that we're, we're cutting off all dialogue. However, every council member here before, before we ever got here has taken a position that some member of the public did not agree with. And all we try to do by enforcing this policy, and that's all it is, is it's a policy, is to make it so that no, no council member, not the ones I agree with, not the ones I d disagree with, is attacked publicly. This isn't an easy job. We're all happy to be doing it, very happy to be doing it, very, very proud to be doing it. And we want to keep that dialogue to a minimum. That's all. So now we have uh, Susan Ruan is on the line. Susan? Um, hello. Oh, hold on. Good evening, Susan. Oh, we got a lot of feedback there. I apologize about that. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> it's a problem of having a lot of devices. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Susan Ruan. I live at 705 Kingsbridge Lane. Um, I just want to discuss the second topic um, that I called in earlier, and that was the that the, was the East Saddle River Bridge. I think it's also known as the Kingsbridge Bridge, whatever. Um, it, it has recently come to my attention that a minor was involved in an accident after the bridge was closed, and he was forced to use the longer road um, through Bolgard down into Hohokus and around back into Ridgewood. Um, thankfully, the child is okay. I have a copy of the police report um, that I redacted his name, but I can send to you. Um, my... My understanding is that the council allocated $100,000 to fix the footbridge. I've also heard that the engineer has billed, is billing the village 40K, so that leaves only 60K to be actually spent on the repairs. Um, what worries me is that 60K might not be enough to repair the bridge, and um, the delays will be held up longer and someone might, um, I'm just trying to think, um, might get hurt or seriously injured in another, you know, while the bridge is closed and they're being forced to use other means. Um, and I just, from listening to the public comments, I just want to comment about um, that, um, just, to, just to remarks, that the meeting is, are for, for the public. And I want to thank you for your services, but um, it's just a kindly reminder that this is for the public and not a private company. Um, the second is the web tab for the Shedler property isn't very clear on the website. And I was hoping that um, people can investigate that because people would like to have all the reports posted up there, all the items posted there. Because if this is going to be a project going, going, we need to have easy access to know what the latest drawings are from the engineer. Um, and then finally, I just want to point out that in the December 7th, 2022 council meeting, which was just at the end of the last year, the, the village engineer um, stated that um, he was working with SHPO for a year um, in hopes to draw up designs to be approved. And literally, he only had a few um, estimates to get before he submitted to SHPO with the hopes for working with them so long that it would be approved. And so when people say that it was only in 2017, there was a lot of work that was spent by the engineer that is now quickly being erased. Um, all right, that was pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I am high as a kite. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Boyd A. Loving, 342 South Irving Street. 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that Mr. White's had some excellent points about uh, the meeting, what to do about trying to get the meeting down. In the private sector, I worked in the private sector for 37 years. This kind of stuff wouldn't, you wouldn't stand for it. I have been at council meetings. I've been attending council meetings regularly for the past 23 years. I've been at council meetings where presentations from vendors have taken an hour and 15 minutes. And I sit in the audience and I said, that could have been done in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no control made whatsoever when presenters are, are here. And to the mayor's point, if you put it down on the agenda that there's 10 minutes, maybe that gives them some guidance that they've got 10 minutes. I've seen slide decks go up with 50 slides on it from presenters. You know, you've really got to whittle it down. You're an executive body. You don't need to hear all the minutia. You need to hear the major points. So if you try to control the presenters, that would do wonders in terms of controlling the amount of time that you guys and gals have to spend here. And also to Councilman, Councilman White's point, many of you, I feel, and this not intended to be insulting in any way, talk because you like to hear yourselves talk. If you try to limit the amount of time that is devoted to the council uh, reports and things like that, that will also shave a tremendous amount of time over the time that you have to spend here. Um, lastly, just like to comment on what Ms. Weber just called in about. Three attorneys over there, one attorney here, the Sunshine Law specifically states that the public body cannot censor your speech during a public comment portion because it does not agree with you or does not like what you were saying. That's what the Sunshine Law says. So for Ms. Weber to mention somebody's name and the mayor to censor her is not permitted by law. Sunshine Law says you can't do that, yet you did that, and you're an attorney. That's got to stop. If I want to mention somebody's name, as long as it's not a threat, I should be allowed to mention the name. I don't like what you're saying. I'm going to tell you I don't like what you're saying. I should not be told I can't say your name when I say that. Again, the Sunshine Law states that you cannot censor any comments that are made by the public, unless it's a threat, of course. So. Can we straighten that out so that it doesn't happen to people like Ms. Weber again? Thank you very much for your service. Have a good evening. Thank you, Boyd. Yes, um, I gave this opinion with prior counsel when the issue was raised by Mr. Hallaby. You are permitted to name a council member and criticize if you feel you need to criticize that council member. The restrictive aspect of it is not threaten. Threatening is part of it, but if it's disruptive, and if the words are demeaning or in a, in a nature that it becomes a, comes across as being something that is less than respectful, then it can be limited. But you are allowed to name a party and criticize them. So. And I think at the end of the day, the words demeaning and respectful are the key words here. So, um, and, and that is always a matter of opinion. And I think the point that we've all, we've all raised is, let's all just try, let's all just try and be a little nicer. Let's treat each other like neighbors. So, and with that, I just I just want to mention one thing: um, the trial period, the pilot program, is not by ordinance; it's by resolution right. because we are required by law to list all of our meetings for the year. So we're going to have to change the times of the public meetings for those three months. So it has to be done by resolution, and then it has to be sent to the newspapers as well. That's required by law as well. So it will be done by resolution. Great. Thank you. Does anyone have anything to add from the dais? Well, I did want to respond to Denise Lima's uh, question. She's gone now. But uh, we have been working on a renewable government energy aggregation plan since, well, it was brought up to council in 2020. It was passed in February of 2021, and we had to get a consultant. We hired a consultant recently with this council, and uh, the consultant is starting to work. The name Eager is fairly new. 
Uh, so you might not recognize that, but we have been working on this renewable government energy aggregating plan for several council meetings. Anyone else? Uh, I just want to thank Boyd. Um, by the way, I'm glad we kept public comments at the end tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, do I have a motion to adjourn or shall we continue? <laughs> so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone Good opposed? Night, everybody. Thank you.